Greetings, listeners. Welcome back to my little corner of YouTube. My name is Lindsay Pogue. I am the author of the dystopian and historical fantasy series, The Forgotten Lands, and you are about to listen to part two of Josephine and Clayton's adventure in Dust and Shadow. Don't forget, there are links to each part as well as the other books in the series in the description below. Like and subscribe, and I'll see you on the other side. Chapter 13, Joe. Later that afternoon, when I return home, my clothes are already dry from the heat, and my mind is preoccupied with the drifters from the stream. As I unsaddle Duke, I try to fit the pieces together, but I can't. There's a chink in the marshal's story about them, and I'm almost certain it's another fabrication, a cattle prod so we'll all bend in the direction he wills. I take stock of his men closing up the greenhouses. There are dozens of them every day. No matter what power the marshal has over us, fear, water, painful memories, it's reassuring to know that he desperately depends on us. Enough to have his men working our land, knowing this town would starve without us. Rushing out, Duke, I glance around for my father, surprised he's absent from his workshed by the pasture. And I don't see him coming in from the greenhouses with the rest of the men either as they head back up to the barn to catch their ride home. Until it's finished, Mr. Ashford shouts to the men in the cattle pasture. He carries a metal post over his shoulder, the sleeves of his shirt wet with sweat and bunched up around his elbows. When he notices me watching him, he straightens. We're fixing that fence for you, Miss Mason, he explains. I nod at him, waving slightly in gratitude despite myself. It's their job, after all. Most of the marshal's men nod politely as they walk past the stable, and I realize they're like cattle themselves, most of them loyal members of the herd that does all the marshal's bidding. Like Mr. Ashford, their shirts are drenched in sweat, some in long sleeves to protect themselves from the sun, others in short sleeves with skin like tanned leather. I wish I knew how many of them are murderers themselves, and how many of them know what the marshal really is. I lead Duke into his stable for oats, then bid him good night and head toward the house. I brace myself for Scarlet's scolding, whether it's because I'm a complete wreck or because I disappeared all day. But I hear Scarlet's easy laugh when I step inside the house, and all seems as it should be. I revel in the cooler air trapped inside by the drawn drapes and shut the door behind me. Oh, I hear her chirp, followed by the pitter-patter of her light footsteps in the hallway. There you are. Scarlet rushes toward me, her eyes wide and more anxious than I expect. Where have you been? She wraps her arms around me, the scent of honey and lemon wafting off her. I'm sorry, I breathe, tightening my arms around her. I yearn to confide in her and tell her what I've discovered, to plot a way out of all of this. I didn't mean to worry you. I hadn't meant to be gone for so long, but... I lean away from her and lower my voice peering into her emerald eyes. I've had the most. We've been waiting for you, my father says quietly from the hallway. Are you all right? I peer up and find him in his dinner clothes. Really, Joe? Scarlet takes a step back to assess me. You look as if you've been drowned and hung out to dry. Surely I'm not that bad. I hear footsteps and Clayton steps out of the sitting room and stops beside my father. He bows his head a little in greeting. Miss Mason? What is he doing here? I rasp without thinking, unable to take my eyes off him. He's in a pressed linen shirt and fitted pants and looks presentable, clean-shaven even, and so very, very out of place in my home. Clayton straightens under my scrutiny, and his mouth pulls up in a half-smile. I've come to call on you, Miss Mason. It seemed appropriate, given the circumstances. Joe, Scarlet says, her voice willing me to look at her. Why don't you get cleaned up and we can sit down for an early supper since we have a guest tonight? I tear my gaze away from Clayton and stare at my sister. Joe? She hedges. I blink at her. Only now do I realize she's in her evening dress. Her hair is pulled up, exposing her elegant neck, which is adorned with a gemstone necklace I've never seen before. My face reddens and I try to control my swirling thoughts and shaking hands. Get cleaned up, my father says, his voice taut. 
It's clear he's not happy, but his expression is lost behind bruises that splotch the skin beneath his eyes and around his temple, a reminder of last night. Whether he's unhappy because of me or our guest, I can't tell. Am I supposed to act as if I'm happy to see Clayton? I scowl at him for the briefest of moments before the red in my vision subsides long enough to remember there are consequences to my actions. His eyes don't leave mine, either. Come, Scarlet says, leading me toward the staircase. Jane, she calls, and the mousy-haired housekeeper comes in from the kitchen. Can you please help my sister bathe and change? I'll ask Nathan to take over in the kitchen for a bit. Jane nods, though I doubt she appreciates allowing her father, wonderful as he is, to meddle with her dinner. Scarlet hurries into the kitchen and Jane stops in front of me. Shall we, miss? Remembering myself, I nod, swallow, and trail her up the stairs, grateful when I hear Scarlet's footsteps on the steps behind me. We'll be back momentarily, she calls downstairs, and I follow Jane without a word into the washroom. Scarlet shuts the door behind us and begins to unbutton my top. I am fully capable of undressing myself. I rush out, waving her away. Sorry, Scarlet says and clasps her hands together. I've been so worried, and then Mr. Cunningham showed up. Papa gave him a tour of the ranch, and I invited him to stay for dinner because he's been waiting around for you. I wasn't sure what else to do. Papa requested an early supper, and we'll send him home as soon as possible. The invisible weight on my chest seems to lighten a little. Really? Of course. After what the marshal pulled last night, how could Papa not be distrusting of him? She shakes her head. None of that matters right now. We've got to get you down there. If no one wants Mr. Cunningham here. Joe, really, don't you dare. You know it's not that simple. It was just a thought, I grumble. A tiny hint of a smile parts her lips and warms my heart. Though it's no laughing matter, Scarlet's ease puts my nerves to rest, at least for the moment. Jane pumps the water a few more times, filling the basin at least halfway. With a grimace, Scarlet holds out my shirt. This is bad, Joe, even for you. She bats off a few burrs. Did you fall asleep again? Among other things, I say wryly, but I don't try to explain what else I encountered as I plop down on the bench against the wall to untie my boots. A rock falls onto the white tile floor as I tug them off. Oh, my word, I can't even, she says, exasperated, and Scarlet drapes my dirty blouse across the bench. I stand, pulling my trousers off at my feet as she hurriedly unbraids my hair and Jane strips off the remaining remnants of the day. I feel like a child, I tell them, but Scarlet ignores me. She motions for me to get into the tub as Jane pumps the water one last time. It's cool against my skin, but refreshing in the heat of the upper level. Jane, can you bring in her robe, please? Scarlet asks, and I watch as the maid disappears from the washroom, tugging the door shut behind her. My sister runs her fingers through my hair, then kneels down to meet my eyes. Her gaze is piercing, and as quickly as it was buried, the weight of all that's happened resurfaces again. Are you all right? She asks, rubbing my arm. Truly, Joe, when I didn't see you this morning, I questioned whether or not to come find you. Mr. Ashford talked me out of it. He thought you might need time to yourself. Mr. Ashford? I can't help my surprise. Why would he care? Scarlet eyes me carefully. Are you angry with him? For not warning us, I mean? Yes, I admit. But also no. Why would he? He works for the marshal. His alliance isn't with us. Though it's true, I don't say it to hurt her. Even if I wish it were, for your sake. Her thoughts are distant for a moment, and she peers down at the water dripping from her hands. At least Clayton has been pleasant, she tells me. Quite the gentleman, in fact. Yes, well, charm is something he does not fall short of. Scarlet tilts her head and her eyes fill with sympathy. I want you to know that I don't encourage this marriage, Joe. But if we can't figure a way out of this, at least he's not a horrible man, like his father. I don't think you need to fear him. I nod in agreement because she expects it of me. That's true, but he's clearly his father's puppet. I clear my throat as Jane stumbles back into the room my robe draped over her shoulder and a stack of clean towels in her arms. Now, I say, let me finish in peace. I'll hurry, I promise. 
Scarlet eyes me for a heartbeat before I shoo her away. Jane can help me finish. Go relieve father. I'll be down as soon as I can. Scarlet turns and heads for the door. I'll lay out your violet dress and a hairpiece. It looks the best on you. I have no one to impress, I remind her. If I were smart, I would have stayed in my soiled clothes. Scarlet ignores me and blows me a genteel kiss before she shuts Jane and me inside. By the time I get downstairs, the sun is setting behind the mountains. I can hear Scarlet and Clayton chatting in the sitting room, if a bit stiltedly, followed by the sounds of another log being thrown onto the fire. Nathan must be preparing the house for nightfall, but I dread the thought of Clayton being here much longer than that. Taking a deep breath, I prepare myself for a couple of hours of forced pleasantries before I step into the doorway. I'm surprised to find it's Clayton crouched in front of the fire, tending to it. Scarlet is sitting on the love seat, smiling at something Clayton must have said as she sews a burgundy ribbon onto a bonnet. My father stands at the window, gazing out at the cloudy orange haze of the sunset. I groan internally. Timing couldn't be worse for a storm and I silently plead that it will shift another direction. Miss Mason, Clayton says, rising to his feet. His eyes linger on me for the smallest of moments before he bows his head. My lips may curve in a slight smile, but I can't bring myself to do much more than that. I clench my hands at my sides and step into the room. Mr. Cunningham, I say, and offer him a small curtsy. I never think much about traditions and customs until I'm around the marshal. And now Clayton. I decide I hate them. My father turns around, his eyes meeting mine before Scarlet pats the love seat for me to sit beside her. She hands me the bonnet. What do you think of it now, Joe? She asks. I took off the yellow like you recommended. I think Mrs. Northman will like it this way. I nod, though I can only think of Clayton's eyes on me as I sit down. Yes, much better. When I meet his gaze, there is a sharpness in his eyes that startles me, and I quickly look away. So, what did I miss? I ask, smoothing out my dress. I can hardly bear the idea of sitting in silence. Sorry it took me so long. I wasn't expecting company. I wasn't planning on it myself, Miss Mason, Clayton says with amusement. But I owe you an apology for last night, so I knew I must come. I glower at him before I can stop myself. An apology? I clarify, for which part? I don't bother listing the possibilities, though I would desperately like to. He glances from me to my sister, then to my father, before he clears his throat. I doubt he was planning on an audience for this conversation, and I inwardly revel in his discomfort. I know my father's announcement came as quite a shock to you. To me as well, actually, but I was hoping we might be able to find some common ground in all of this. Scarlet gets up and walks over to my father, both of them busying themselves on the other side of the room to give us more privacy, though I will her to come back and sit beside me. Common ground? I see. So you disagree with the marriage then? I ask, hopeful. Clayton glances at my father. At first, perhaps, he says. My heart sinks to my stomach as he stalls, searching for his next words. But? But. I believe it would be prudent for both of our families if we were to marry. Clayton watches me, measuring me too closely for comfort, and I have to look away from him or risk him seeing too much. Your family's lives rest in the balance, I remind myself, knowing it is the only truth that could keep hateful words from my lips. Miss Mason, he starts again, I'm aware we know little of one another, and I promise you that I would have gone about all of this much differently had I had any clue of it last night. But I didn't, and here we are. I would like to start over, if that's at all possible. The softness of his voice surprises me, but the future seems to blare more loudly than any kindness in his voice. So we are still to be married. I stare into the burgeoning fire, and I have no choice. The words are barely a breath as I imagine myself standing beside Clayton in the church, the marshal looming closely behind. Clayton lowers himself to the edge of the love seat and looks at me, his gaze earnest. As my father mentioned, he says more quietly, 
I must marry, and you are the obvious choice. Your family is... I lean away from him. The obvious choice? I rise to my feet, fully prepared to march from the room. How on earth is a marriage between two people, nearly strangers who don't care for one another, I might add, obvious in any form of the word? Please, Miss Mason, I understand that you're upset, and rightly so. But if you and I could speak privately, perhaps we can start off on better terms. His candor would be admirable, if I trusted it. He says father's son, after all. I try to steady my heartbeat before I dare answer him. I look at my father, his eyes pleading with me, and I know we can't afford two Cunninghams working against us. When I don't answer Clayton right away, he removes himself from the divan with a sigh and retreats to one of the windows. I watch him curiously, surprised by his internal battle as he rubs his hand over his face. My father combs his mustache with his fingers and nods for me to go to Clayton as he passes. I know that look. I hate that look. With an exhale, I force myself from the divan and walk over to my would-be betrothed at the same window where I waited for my mother to return all those years ago. The memory fills me with emotions I can't bear right now, and I try to push them away. My father moves to stand by the fire, and Scarlet positions herself on the farthest cushion of the couch from us. There is no privacy, despite their efforts, and yet the distance of the room that separates me from Scarlet feels like a yawning canyon. I glance from her to Clayton. His back is to me, his hand braced on the side of the window. I pick at the gray belt of my bodice, stalling as I force myself to swallow the lump in my throat. A storm is coming. I say absently as I follow his gaze out the window. I think I hear an amused sound escape Clayton before he says, yes, it is, I should go. It strikes me that Clayton doesn't seem to want to be here any more than I want him to be, and I feel a sense of relief. You said a marriage between us would be beneficial for both of us. Do you even wish to marry, Mr. Cunningham? I ask after a thoughtful moment. He regards me from the corner of his eye, and the dying sunlight makes his blue irises gleam. I didn't want to marry, no. Even now, I'm not sure what I want, if I'm being honest, but the water changes things, Miss Mason. Surely you can see that. I think it a smart move for both of us. He looks at me, gauging my response. We both have much to gain from this marriage, notwithstanding an heir to our family lineage. I nod, though I don't believe those are his words. Perhaps, I concede, pushing the strange image of a family with Clayton from my mind. And love is not a priority to you in a marriage? An entire lifetime together? My words implicate more disdain than intended. I'm just curious, I add quickly. Clayton peers out the window again. I don't know if he's staring at the impending storm or at the glass tops of the greenhouses reflecting the dying sunlight. His profile strikes me as it did the other day strong and angular, a blonde stubble beginning around his jaw. I wonder what sort of man he will resemble in ten years. A lighter, less villainous-looking man than his father, I hope. In a perfect world, Miss Mason, love would be optimal, I grant you. But times are far from perfect. I want a better life for my family and sister, the same as you would want for your children one day, I imagine. I hold his gaze a moment. I don't want him as my husband any more than he would like me as his wife, that much is obvious, though he does seem more open to the idea than I would have expected. For being completely in the dark about our engagement, you seem to be coping with all of this better than I am. He chuckles. Not at all. His laughter is light and lifts some of the tension from the room. I recall his roguish grin at the dance last night, then imagine him drunk with a big-breasted, cherry-faced whore on his lap to ease his pain. The picture of my future husband, a constant fixture in a brothel, sours my stomach. Coping is an interesting word choice, he muses. There is more amusement in his voice than I could ever feel in this moment. His stare hardens, a hot iron against my skin. It could be far worse, Miss Mason, I dare say. Could it? Though his words were meant as some form of a compliment, his flattery only angers me more. Lies, charm, contagious smiles. I don't know if I believe a word he says. 
I will have a husband who has slept with half the town. I say the last part under my breath, but I regret the way his expression falters at my jibe and I bite my tongue. I apologize, that was rude. Clayton shakes his head and grins, though I don't think he's amused anymore. If it isn't me that you marry, he says more forcefully, it would be someone else. He looks at my father, who pretends to be reading a book by the fire. Your father has two daughters and an entire ranch of crops and livestock to keep safe. It's what's provided you the lifestyle you've become so accustomed to. Why would any of you want to risk that changing? My jaw clenches, and I bite back the urge to call him on his not-so-subtle threat. I mean no offense, Miss Mason. Like you, I'm simply stating the facts as you and I both know them to be. I might be a gambler and a rake of sorts, but you are a woman in need of protection, and I can offer you that, at least. I assure you, my sister breaks in, surprising both of us as she steps closer. The mere idea of marriage is repugnant to Joe. Take no offense, Mr. Cunningham. She takes my hand, rescuing Clayton and I from each other. Joe, come see what he's brought for you. She smiles politely at Clayton and leads me toward the door. I admit, Clayton says as he follows behind me, I wasn't sure what you might like, so some of it my mother chose for you. We stop beside a blackened trunk by the doorway, and Scarlet crouches down to open it. Here, allow me, she says and the top creaks open. A silk dress is folded on top, brown with black pinstripes, which Scarlet shakes out and fawns over. I'm sure your sister can put it to pieces for something more to your taste, but my mother thought you might like the fabrics. Yes, I admit, surprising myself. I like them very much. Scarlet oohs and ahs over silk damasks and cashmere shawls. Some of them appear as though they are brand new, others only a bit moth-eaten. Then she thrusts a velvet bag into my hand. You open this one at least, she demands. This is all for you, she clarifies. I flush a little, uncertain how exactly a woman being forced to marry a murderer's son is supposed to act when said son lavishes her with gifts, and pretty ones at that. It feels wrong to appreciate and accept them. I pull a few leather bracelets from the velvet clutch, and one made of metal with such intricate engravings it reminds me of the inner workings of a clock. There are crystal earrings and clips for my hair. Look, Jill, Scarlet hands me a stack of books. History, I say, reading the covers. Medicine. You said you like to read, so I stopped in to see Ms. Reinhurst today. She told me what you like, at least what she remembers you liking. I took a few out of my collection at home as well. I eye the covers running my fingers over the leather bindings and the worn ends of the pages. They're perfect. Just when I am about to offer him a genuine thank you, I see a butterfly brooch with purple and black crystal beads on the wings, and my heart stills. It's not my mother's necklace, but it reminds me of her all the same, and it's beautiful. I remove it from a box of other jewelry and finger the cool metal in my hands, brushing my fingertips over the beadwork. In a place where all metals are precious, the fact that he gave me such a gift is surprising. It's exquisite, I say, astonished. I turn to face him, oblivious for a moment to who he is and what he stands for. It's all absolutely perfect. I hold the brooch against my chest. Thank you. There is a flash of confusion in his eyes, and then relief. He dips his head. I'm happy you like it. I hoped something would be to your liking. There is sincerity in his voice that stops me from answering him, uncertain what to say. Look at this, Scarlet shrieks. I force my gaze away from Clayton's and find her petting a large fur throw. We have no animals here that size with fur so plush, nor so dark. The furs I'd seen on the strangers at the stream were as rich with browns and inky grays as this one. More puzzle pieces begin to fall into place, and I wonder how many of these items were pillaged artifacts from Doyle's wagon, and how many of Doyle's artifacts were stolen or worse. Where did you get that? I demand. Though I try to contain the accusation in my voice, I can't. I know it's not from here, and distrust tightens my jaw. Clayton's eyes narrow to slits. Where? I grind out. It's from my mother, 
he finally says. By all means, if you don't like it, I'll take it back to her. Joe, Scarlet hisses, what's wrong with you? Jane clears her throat from the doorway. I beg your pardon, she says with a curtsy to my father. The storm has shifted this way. Nathan's gone out to check the greenhouses and outbuildings, sir. My father's jaw clenches, but he doesn't look at any of us before he steps out of the room. I'll be right back, he says, his footsteps retreating to the front door. Jane stays in the doorway, blinking between me and Clayton as if she's not sure what to do. The heavy metal shutters slide into place around the house, making the walls shudder and creak as the room falls into darkness. Dinner is ready, miss, Jane finally says. Clayton straightens his shoulders, his expression just as uneasy as mine and cast in firelight. I let out a hapless breath. Then we'd better eat. Chapter 14 Clayton A hopeless night. That's what the last few hours after dinner had felt like. A hopeless night with a woman I'm not sure I can sway. A woman meant to be my wife. A woman who is determined to hate the sight of me. It's a bloody mess, and I resent my father for getting me into this to begin with. A draft whistles through the room as I lay in a strange bed. A candle burns low on the bedside table, shadows dancing across the walls, the cobwebs tucked up in the corner of the room illuminated. Lightning flashes and thunder rumbles, making the house quake. I watch as a piece of peeling wallpaper trembles with each gust of wind. The wooden bed frame creaks when I toss and groans when I turn. And every time I close my eyes, I see the awe on Josephine's face when she held the butterfly brooch in her hand. How unexpectedly happy that had made me, knowing that I could put a smile on her face and not the false one she flashes everyone when she's expected to, even if it was quickly extinguished. When I imagine a marriage between us, it's not a happy one. How changeable she is, hot and cold, not like the women I'm used to. The steel shutters covering the arched windows thump against the house, loose in their hinges. I glare at them. The Cunningham estate, in all of its garish extravagance, is at least well kept. This place, positioned at the mouth of the valley, it's not surprising that this home has seen better days. It's a patchwork of metal sheeting and chipped sunburnt paint. The interior wallpapers are faded floral bouquets, and songbirds perch upon the paper from a world that doesn't exist anymore. It's a time capsule, and any rich color was dulled long ago. Yet, in spite of its ugliness, this old Victorian feels like a home, and I'm envious of that. I can imagine the Masons spending their evenings downstairs in easy silence, Scarlet and Josephine playful with one another, as I've seen them when they think I'm not looking. At the Cunningham estate, Kitty's resentment toward me hangs like a toxic fog around us. My father's distance is gaping, and my mother's happiness dwindles as Izzy's illness worsens. She's the one true goodness that seems to keep us together. I know any hope of sleep is lost when the grandfather clock chimes one o'clock on the landing, and I throw my blankets off and sit up in bed. Rather than toss and turn, feeling claustrophobic and unsettled, I decide to go downstairs, where I don't have to hear the servants restless above me. Snatching up my shirt from the foot of the bed, I pull it over my head and reach for the candlestick. Quietly, I turn the glass doorknob, praying it doesn't creak as loudly as everything else in this place as I open it. I hold the candlelight in front of me, waiting, listening. There's no movement in the house, save for the dust floating in the air. The floorboards are cool against my bare feet as I pass three other doors along the hall, studying each of them as if I might be able to tell which is Josephine's. Slowly, I make my way down the staircase, taking in the craftsmanship of the woodwork, the character. Paintings and old photographs hang along the wall, all different sizes with mismatching frames. Black and white photos mix with slightly colored images, 
most of them of people I don't recognize. Scarlet's garnet hair and green eyes catch my attention, and I study the family portrait. She looks almost angelic as she sits on her father's lap. Josephine stands beside them, a mischievous twinkle in her eyes. Her dark hair looks nearly black in the absence of sunlight, and I wonder how miserable she must have been sitting for a portrait. But it's Mrs. Mason that strikes me the most. I hold the candle flame closer. She stands behind her daughter's long ruby red hair cascading over her shoulders, and blue eyes the color of two lapis stones gaze back at me. Another painting of their mother hangs further down the stairs. It's an earlier portrait of her. I can see Josephine in her features, her high cheekbones, her bow-shaped mouth that quirks up in the corner when she's amused. Eyes that could peer into your soul, exposing everything vulnerable a man keeps hidden. And an emotion I can't quite put my finger on. Unexpectedly, I can feel the Mason family's loss. I remember Mrs. Mason sitting beside my bed, a soft-voiced angel in my feverish haze. My father is right. She did have a healing way about her. She was my saving grace in an inferno of misery. I continue to the sitting room where I spent most of this afternoon and find my thoughts lingering on Josephine. The hatred in her eyes was almost otherworldly, and I want to know what it is that she doesn't say. Gazing around the room, I try not to dwell on the awkwardness of tomorrow once everyone wakes. A box shimmers from the card table in the corner of the room, and I walk to it. I recognize the black lace and turquoise beads from Josephine's dress at the party and stroke the delicate material between my fingers. She was stunning, an unexpected transformation, but somehow the memory of her in trousers this afternoon hugging curves I never see beneath her skirts, leaves a more lasting impression. I have to remind myself who I'm thinking of. Miss Mason, innocent, prudish, delectable in her own way. I drop the lace and step away from the table, uncertain where my tired mind begins to wander. Setting the candlestick down on the sofa table, I eye the crystal decanters situated atop the bookshelf, I pull the stopper from an amber-colored bottle and sniff the contents. Brandy, perhaps. My father's drink of choice, but I pour myself two fingers and take a greedy drink. None of this was what I'd bargained for. And as I regard the pull I feel both toward and away from Josephine, I feel myself floundering with indecision and confusion. With a huff, I blow out the candle and plop down onto the divan to sit in darkness, letting the steady howl of the wind and the thick taste of brandy coat my mind. Chapter 15, Joe. Papa, I cry out, my voice wavering with fear and exhaustion from overuse. Papa, please, I'm in here. My body trembles. Papa! I call for him, over and over, shouting his name until my voice is so hoarse and my body so weak from straining against the ropes that I struggle to stand. Drip, drip, drip. It feels like hours have passed, and the grating sounds of dripping water and rats scurrying somewhere around me drive me toward the brink of madness. I woke up here, and I wonder if it's in this cavern I will die, alone. Drip. Please, I moan. It's more of a whisper, and I let my arms slacken above me. Papa. My plea is little more than a whisper, and I fall to my knees. Then the sound of his footsteps echo in this dark, abandoned place, and I know he's come to rescue me. Flickering light brightens outside the door as he approaches, and my heart begins to race with relief. Papa. Shh. Quiet, Miss Mason comes a low voice. Mr. Ashford steps into view. He looks altered, much older than he is, 
like my father's age, and there's a desperation in the way he moves that brings more tears to my eyes. I tug at the ropes as he draws closer, my screams resounding through the space. Quiet, he growls and covers my mouth with his hand. He's coming. You'll only make it worse. Calm down. But I can't. My body quakes. My heart beats so fast I can barely breathe. He's coming. Mr. Ashford, I squeak. I have to go to the bathroom, please. I don't recognize my voice, so petrified and despairing. I need to go to the bathroom, I beg. I don't bother telling him it's too late. Please? Mr. Ashford shakes his head as he adjusts my ropes, and I sniffle back tears. I've tried to distract him, he explains. The rope untwists, and I feel the blood pumping to my arm again. He's in a bad state, miss. I glance from his face to where he's fiddling with the rope. Are, are you going to let me go? Laughter, deep and mirthless, echoes through the room and the marshal steps through the doorway. Let you go, he asks and shakes his head. Your father, your mother, they defy me and you think I will simply let you go? Mr. Ashford takes a hurried step back. My eyes find his, silently begging him to do something, but he doesn't move again, even though his eyes are filled with sorrow and dread. Leave me, the marshal rasps, his face red, his eyes swollen, and a sneer slowly crosses his face. Mr. Ashford steps toward him. Marshal, I said get out, he shouts, his entire body shaking. Mr. Ashford does so without another second of hesitation, and as he leaves me alone, I see another man in the doorway. The older man, Doyle, the one I watched hit my father over and over again. He smiles. The marshal crouches and leans into me, the torchlight so bright in his hand and its heat so near it burns my eyes. I cower against the wall behind me, but the marshal grabs onto my chin and forces me to meet his branding gaze. I blink in the heat of the fire, catching the way his eyes search my face, back and forth, over and over, until they fill with tears. You've brought this on yourself, he says, his spittle wet against my face. His mustache is wet and glistening. But I didn't, I didn't do anything, I say through ragged sobs, and I pull away from him, back to the wall that's my only comfort. It's the old mines, I realize too old and dangerous to ever play in. So far away and forgotten, no one will ever find me. I didn't do anything, I repeat. The marshal chuckles. My papa. Charles is a pathetic excuse for a man, he sneers. He was never worth your affections. But, I shake my head, terrified I might never leave this place. I hide my face in the crook of my shoulder and shut my eyes. What are you going to do to me? I pull again at the ropes Mr. Ashford had been fiddling with, but the knots are still too tight, and my arms still hang heavily above me. I'm going to teach you all a lesson, the marshal says calmly, and the air shifts beside me as he stands. When his footsteps move further away, I open my eyes. You and I will both teach him. The marshal wobbles on his feet and takes a drink from an amber bottle on a broken table by the door. It's the only way. His voice is so soft and eerily changed that I squeeze my eyes shut and will myself awake from this horrible nightmare. Do you think you can deny me? He slurs, and it's as if he's talking to a ghost I can't see. That I would just let you leave after everything? I peek at him as he paces the room, asking questions I don't understand. When I can't take the sound of his voice anymore, when I can't listen to his threats and anger and hatred for me any longer, I begin to sing the lullaby Mama hummed for me. I think of her, dead, and what my own fate might be. Suddenly, I want nothing more than to be with her and away from this place. The marshal kicks the wall beside me. Enough, he shouts. I shriek and cower away, biting my lips so that all I can do is focus on the taste of blood and the pain. 
My ears rang with the echo of his voice. I gave you a choice and you brought this upon yourself. With renewed purpose, he hurries over to the door and shoves his torch into the holder. I'm not sure if he's crying or laughing as his body shakes. He doesn't look at me again for more heartbeats than I can count. Please, let me go home, I say quietly. I won't upset you ever again. The marshal's shoulders stiffen. He reaches for a riding crop on a shelf I hadn't seen in the darkness and stomps over to me. No, he snarls, ripping my butterfly necklace from around my neck. You won't. I swallow the urge to cry out as my eyes fly open and I reach for my throat. It doesn't burn as I remember it. A dream, I tell myself, my voice hoarse from disuse, not from screaming. Something thumps against the house in the wind, but the draft in the room is cool against my damp skin. My heart is galloping so fast I squeeze my eyes shut and force myself to catch my breath. I try not to think about my father's cries when Mr. Ashford had brought me home. I try not to think of the days that passed with him by my bedside, a guilt-ridden, broken mess, while little Scarlet took care of us both in my mother's place. I try not to hear the marshal's growls over and over in my head. Next time, I'll kill one of you. With a deep inhale, I sit up and stare around my room, trying to regain my bearings as the nightmare begins to subside. My palm rests against my bare chest, the absence of my mother's necklace more acute than usual, the memory of that day more vivid than it has been in a very long time. The wind howls through the rafters like the half-starved, lonely wolves that stalk the deadlands. It used to be white noise to me, the hum I needed to fall asleep. Now it's the maleficent whisper of things to come, and a reminder that Clayton Cunningham is in the room next to mine, asleep. Unable to shake the chill of the night, I kick off my blankets. When I climb out of bed, the rug beneath my feet is soft despite its ragged appearance. The years have been unkind to all of us. We're wind-battered, thirsty, tired, trapped. I will not marry the spawn of the devil. Nothing could possibly tempt me. But I think of my sister, sleeping safely in her room down the hall, and I know that's not true and that I must. Too restless to sleep, I tiptoe to the door. The knob is cool to the touch and I slowly turn it. The door creaks open, though not enough to disturb anyone against the sound of the angry wind, and on deft feet, I make my way down the stairs. I consider sneaking into the kitchen for a snack, but my stomach still roils from my dream, and I retreat to the comfort of the sitting room instead. It's swallowed by shadows, and though thunder rolls in the night around us, it's quiet. A different kind of quiet than the loneliness of my room. Perhaps it's the memories of my mother in here, or perhaps it's the distance between me and Clayton. I step up to one of the windows and pull back the drapes to peek through the crooked seam between the steel shutters. They are warped from years of violent storms and unyieldingly hot sun, and muted moonlight and flashes of lightning filter into the room. Our home, this entire place, is a sinking sandpit, consuming us so slowly no one realizes they are sinking at all until it's too late. All because of the water, the land. I stare through the crack at nothing in particular. Eleven years seems so long ago, though I fear the memory will always haunt me, despite the passage of time. I heave a deep breath, causing my sleeping gown to slide off my shoulder and lean against the cool wall. Without the fire or a robe to keep me warm, I shiver. My fingertips brush over the scars, inching their way up my back as I adjust my shoulder strap. Though they have become a part of me, I still at the sensation of marred flesh beneath my fingers. The tearing, the burning. It was excruciating, and the memory of the sting is so acute it takes all I have not to scream at how cruel life is. Tears fill my eyes not because of the memory of that day or because of the pain, but because the marshal walks around this place unscathed. He touches me. He smiles at me as if he hasn't stolen everything. My pride, my childhood, my mother. 
even if he denies killing her, I saw the wildness in his eyes that night in the cavern. I know what he's done to me. My father's words replay over and over from the day the marshal and his men brought us her body. My father blamed the marshal instantly. What did he know that I didn't? As I idly brush my fingers over my scars, I knew innately something happened between my mother and the marshal. A scuffle, an argument, and he snuffed out her life as if it were candlelight he no longer needed. Because Clayton was sick and she wasn't healing him quickly enough? Had the marshal wanted to teach my father a lesson simply because of his accusations? The thought of his son upstairs, the marshal's flesh and blood in my home, where I've grown to feel safe again, makes me wish for a split second that I had died that day with my mother. At least then the marshal would have no more power over me. A throat clears behind me and I whirl around. Clayton, I swallow my surprise, staring at his motionless outline on the divan. He's so silent and still I hadn't even registered him. He leans into a strip of moonlight. His hair is mussed, his linen shirt loose and open, exposing the pale skin of his chest. He's a vision in white and almost glowing against the darkness surrounding him. Unkempt, he looks more human than I've ever seen him, and inexplicably, my cheeks begin to burn and I wrap my arms around my chest. I wasn't expecting anyone to be awake, I think aloud. My gown is inappropriate, and being alone in a room at night with a man is suddenly all I can think about as the next words tumble from between my lips. Is your room comfortable? Is there something I can get you? He sets down an empty glass and rises to his feet, slowly, like a cat might move when stalking a finch. My room is fine, he says after a moment. I couldn't sleep. I see, I say quietly, unnerved and uncertain where to look or what to do as he draws nearer. I swallow thickly, and when my eyes finally meet his, I see a softness to his features I never have before. And why, Miss Mason, are you wandering around the house in the dark? The way he looks at me is disarming, and I struggle to think. A dream, I whisper. His eyebrow lifts slightly. An unpleasant dream? He stops in front of me. A gust of wind shakes the house more violently, as if warning me away from him. I nod. A sliver of changeable moonlight stripes his face almost hypnotizing. About what happened to your back? I shrink away at his question. My back? A twisting, sickening discomfort washes over me. Clayton reaches out, his fingers brushing over my shoulder, and he gently turns me around before I understand what he's doing. I want to shout at him to remember himself and take his hands off me but my eyes shut of their own accord as his warm fingertips brush against my skin, heating my insides despite the chill. What's happened to you? He asks, his voice hoarse. The emotion I hear in his words tears at my heart, soothing it at the same time. But the concern in his voice is overshadowed by the game he and his father are playing, me their chess piece. I pull away from him biting my tongue so as not to say something I might regret later. Please, he says earnestly, tell me, what happened to you? Though Clayton may know about the water, and perhaps the possible truth about the drifters and the goods his father's men scavenge, he doesn't know what his father has done to me. The pain in his eyes tells me as much. I lift my chin and meet his gaze. Your father, I tell him plainly, and I brush past him leaving him to ponder that truth alone. Chapter 16, Joe. Bleary-eyed, I make my way down the stairs. Though the shutters are open, the house is cast in an ochre haze, remnants of sand stifling the morning sun. I'm happy to notice the absent sound of the wind, though not happy enough to make my feet move more quickly. Clayton has seen my scars, and that leaves me feeling painfully exposed. With any luck, now that the storm has mostly passed, he'll already be gone, a benefit to sleeping later than usual. The low reverberation of my father's voice in the dining room reaches my ears, followed by my sister's sweet laughter. I pause on the final step. 
The formality of eating in the dining room means that Clayton is still here. My shoulders droop, and when I hear my sister utter my name, I know I can't avoid the dining room forever. Peering down at my trousers, I think I should change into something proper, but decide to follow the faint scent of freshly baked bread instead. Despite my wishful thinking, there is only one empty seat at the table when I step into the dining room. Clayton sits across from Scarlet, reading a letter as he tears a piece of toast with his mouth. His skin is flushed, his hair a little tousled, and his sleeves are rolled up, exposing sun-kissed arms. Good morning, Scarlet chirps, and Clayton's eyes rise to meet mine. Good morning, Miss Mason, he says, dropping his letter. He removes the napkin from his lap and quickly stands with a swallow. Good morning, I reply, and I wonder how his expression could give nothing away. He steps over to my chair and pulls it out for me. His easiness after what transpired between us last night surprises me, like he's unmoved by what I've told him, or perhaps he doesn't want to think about it at all. You slept in, Scarlet says, her red hair shimmering against the muted sunlight. She pours me some sage leaf tea. I hope you don't mind, we started without you. No, not at all, I say carefully, watching Clayton as his attention shifts back to his letter on the table. He cuts a piece of ham and takes a bite. I thought surely you had left, Mr. Cunningham, while the storm let up. I unfold my napkin into my lap. He doesn't spare a glance as he continues to read. On the contrary, we have much to do this morning. We? I glance at my father. Setting his fork down, my father wipes his mustache with his napkin and clears his throat. There is a bit of damage to the stable. I grip the table. The horses are fine, he reassures me. They wouldn't dare run away in that maelstrom last night. When Papa and Clayton went out there this morning, the horses were waiting anxiously for their breakfast, Scarlet reports happily. I see. So Clayton is flush from working out in the sun, I realize, his appetite clearly healthy, and I feel a sense of surprise gratitude for his staying. While my father and I are used to doing much of the work around the farm on our own, someone to help bear the load is always welcome. Watching Clayton from the corner of my eye, I serve myself some eggs. You have letters? I ask, confused. Clayton gulps from his teacup and spares me a quick glance. His eyes are as blue as the sky reflected in glass against his tan face. Yes, when my valet came for me this morning, he delivered them. But you didn't leave with him? He flips the page of his letter and continues reading. No. Hmm. I tear my gaze away from him. Scarlet, can you pass the ham, please? I nod to the corn blue platter beside the teapot. Clayton surprises me again and reaches for it instead, placing it on the tabletop closer to me. I assure you, Miss Mason, he starts, and I can feel his eyes on me as I fork a piece of meat onto my plate. I have no ulterior motive, but as it is Sunday, I thought I might accompany you to town for church. I nearly sigh in relief. I'm afraid I'm not able to go to church today. I paid my dues last week. My father wouldn't make me go again so soon. But what about Mrs. Pelly, Joe? Scarlet asks with wide eyes. You said you would fix her clock, and the boy- I lift an eyebrow and the room falls silent, everyone's attention on me for different reasons. I take a bite of smoked meat, restless under Clayton's gaze. Yes, of course, I finally say. I'd forgotten. But Mr. Cunningham, I say, dabbing my lips with my napkin, we wouldn't want to trouble you. Surely you'd like to return home, change into fresh clothes- his smile is rakish and unnerving. They've already been brought to me, but thank you for your thoughtfulness. I deflate a little. Of course they have. Heat fills my cheeks, along with panic as I realize I will not be rid of him this morning. I take a much-needed sip of tea to coat my drying throat and shakily set my cup down. Clayton's eyes on me feel a lot like his father's cattle brand, two scalding prongs searing into me. I refuse to meet his gaze. Will I be joining the marshal and his family for dinner tonight as well? Will everyone, my family included, continue on as if this is not the worst possible thing that could be happening to me? Knives and forks scrape against chipped china. Paper pages rustle as Clayton folds his letters. It's all so loud in everyone's silence, 
and I lose myself to moving food around on my plate, trying and failing not to think about how quickly my own life is slipping from my control. Would you like more tea, Joe? Scarlet asks as she swallows the last bite of her breakfast. Please, I whisper and scoop my cup closer to her. She glances at me through her lashes, uncertainty or perhaps regret in her eyes. Did the wind keep you awake last night? You're usually up before the rest of us. My eyes shift to Clayton to find he's already looking at me. Yes, the wind. I was a bit restless, I tell her, offering a partial truth, and I peer back down at my plate. Oh, I almost forgot. Scarlet turns in her seat to take a worn, leather-bound book off the buffet behind her. I found something last night while perusing one of the books Mr. Cunningham brought you. She flips the book open to a page she has marked with a pressed yellow cactus flower. Isn't it stunning? She inches the book toward me on the tabletop, sliding the sun-bleached crocheted cloth with it. A sketch of a monarch butterfly bleeds into the marked page. It's spectacular, I say, awed by its graceful beauty. I saw one the other day, not like this exactly, at Mother's grave. I finger the sketch. It was a glittering blue. And you didn't tell me? Scarlet quips with surprise. I would like to go see one. Slowly, my gaze shifts to her, and I can't help a flutter of irritation. I'd forgotten what with all that's happened in the past few days. You like butterflies then? Clayton asks. You seem to admire the brooch yesterday as well. I'm surprised by the amused gleam in his eyes. Yes, a girlish fascination that stuck with me, I guess. I close the book and push it aside to fawn over later. It's not girlish, Joe, Scarlet rebukes. Not like a frilly dress or a new bonnet. They are special, she says, and I wish she'd leave it alone. Special? Clayton asks. And what is it they mean to you, Miss Mason? I only ask because my mother seems to attract them frequently in her greenhouse. Perhaps you would like to come see them sometime. He leans back in his chair, his full attention leveled on me. What is it, a fond childhood memory? His easy confidence and cocky smile makes me bristle. A childhood memory, I say, staring at his naive expression, but not a fond one. Joe, my father warns, but I ignore him completely. If Clayton wants to combine our families, he gets all the secrets and shadows that come with it. My mother gave me a pendant, a delicate butterfly that was her most cherished possession. His expression is unchanging, and he waits for me to continue. Your father tore it from my neck the day she was murdered, and I haven't seen it since. Clayton's eyebrows draw together, and the color drains from his face. Confusion and disbelief cause his easy expression to waver, and he clears his throat. After a brief moment, Clayton opens his mouth to say something, but he closes it almost immediately, thinking better of it. When he's ready to hear more, he'll ask. That much I've learned about him. Only, I wonder if it will be me, he asks, or his father, and what I wouldn't give to see the shock on Marshall Cunningham's face when Clayton does. Time to go, Joe, Scarlet calls from the front door. I groan as I scurry down the stairs. My apologies. Jane's completely given up on me, I believe. When I notice Clayton standing at the door beside my sister in his tailored suit, I can't help but appreciate how magnificent he looks in the drab entry room. I take a quick survey of myself in the hall mirror and whimper. My hair is a bit wild today, despite Jane's efforts to tame it down my back, but it will have to do. Pinching my cheeks for some color, I turn to the door, surprised to find Clayton smiling at me. So this is what it's like, he muses, and Scarlett and I exchange a quick look. To be with normal women he clarifies and looks at his pocket watch. If I were at home now, I would be seated in the parlor with a sweet tea and a book, having completely given up hope as I wait for Kitty and my mother to come down. He stuffs his hand back into his pocket. Here you both are, a picture of beauty, and I'm still able to enjoy the trappings of my youth. I catch myself smiling, imagining Kitty whining and fidgeting after hours of primping as she's ushered out of the house by her family, already late for church. Clayton's face brightens. My father walks down the hall from his study, 
his hat atop his head and his mustache trimmed. Shall we then? Clayton asks. My man will bring your sand cloaks in case they're needed, he says, offering me his elbow. I nod and take his arm, accepting the day for what it will be and reassuring myself that if for no other reason, I might learn more about Clayton, which softens the blow a bit. Thwarting the marshal's scheme is one thing, but I'll need more in my arsenal to do it. The four of us file out of the house, the sun brighter as the sand clouds continue to disperse. With no breeze, a fine veil of sand lingers in the air, though the blue sky begins to peer through the haze. I inhale fresh air, happy to be out of the house, and smell my father's aftershave wafting off Clayton. It strikes me how strange this all is, having a guest in the house, and a man at that. My betrothed, sent here to parade me into town as the next Mrs. Cunningham. You surprise me, Mr. Cunningham, I say quietly as we stop on the porch to wait for his valet. Clayton smirks and looks at me from the corner of his eye. How so? I'm not sure, really, though you're not entirely what I expected you would be. His smile threatens to disarm me, and I force myself to look away from him. You expected me to be a tyrant, perhaps more like my father, he asks, clearly amused by my revelation. I, no. I stare out at the surrounding sagebrush and mesquite trees. Perhaps. I just thought you'd be more, that you'd be different, that's all, I say dumbly. He's the marshal's son and a known rake, yet he's the picture of gentlemanly behavior and kindness. I can't seem to reconcile the two. We step off the porch as the carriage pulls up from around the house, and Clayton turns to me. Despite what's happened between us, Miss Mason, I want you to know that I am not like my father, nor any of his men, he says with more seriousness. Whatever's happened in the past, whatever he has allowed, is not who I am. My father and I are more different than you could possibly know. The sincerity in his voice is comforting, and a knot of emotions tighten inside me as the implications of his words settle in. I want to ask him what he means exactly, but I'm too afraid. I just want what's best for everyone. Though I want to point out to him that a forced marriage is not at all what's best for me, I appreciate his idealism, even if I'm convinced his father is only using him as a pawn. Ready, Mr. Cunningham? His valet in a perfectly tailored wool suit gestures toward the carriage. Have you been out here waiting? I ask, a little horrified. Surely he could have come inside the house, out of the sand and increasing heat. I took breakfast with the others, miss, the valet says, and I realize he means with Jane and Nathan in the kitchen. Sanderson can take care of himself, Clayton reassures me, taking my hand. Allow me, Miss Mason. As he helps me inside, I think about how firm and warm his fingers are through my lace gloves and of his affable smile. Then I think about the women in the brothel, and against my will, my thoughts begin to drift. Once Scarlet and my father are nestled inside with me, Clayton climbs in. Thank you, Sanderson, he says absently, and his valet hands him our cloaks and shuts us in. We shouldn't linger in town too long today my father says as the carriage jostles to a start. The storms are too unpredictable lately, and I don't want to be caught out in the next one. He looks between Scarlet and me, and I wonder if it's truly the storms that he's concerned about. We stop at Mrs. Pelly's and church, and that's it. Scarlet and I nod, and the four of us make our way into town in amicable silence. I watch Clayton from the corner of my eye as he stares out the window. I want to know what he's thinking, despite myself. I trust your house is in order after the storm, and your mother and sisters are all right? Clayton looks at me, surprised perhaps by my inquiry. Yes, thank you. Everyone is fine. He dips his head in gratitude and gazes back out the window. Scarlet leans toward me and brushes my hair off my shoulder hastily to cover the edge of my scars I know peek up from the dip in the back of my dress. My cheeks flush, and when I glance at my father, he's peering out the window but Clayton's eyes are fixed on my back, his brow furrowed. Finally, he looks at me, but he says nothing and eventually returns his attention out the window. It's nearly two miles of rough road into town, and though it generally seems to pass too quickly given my penchant for avoiding it as much as necessary, 
Today, it feels like an hour has passed in a matter of minutes. We're lost in awkward silence before I notice the cacti and sagebrush begin to thin. The outline of town comes into view, and I never thought I'd be so relieved to see it. The carriage slows as we get within view of the jail at the entrance of town. Mr. Cunningham, sir? His valet calls down to him, and we roll to a stop. What is it, Sanderson? Clayton opens the door and sticks his head out. I can't make out Sanderson's muttering, but soon after, Clayton settles beside me again and looks pointedly at my father. There's a crowd gathered in front of the garrison. My man can cut through the back alleys and take the way of the grunge, but otherwise. I'd like to see why they are gathering, I say quickly. I'd like to know what's happening. Something tells me it's important, especially if everyone is crowding around. Is it safe? Scarlet asks, glancing between us. It's probably a brawl, my father mutters. Well, they aren't running for their lives, that's a good sign, I tell her, trying to see out my window beyond the carriage. When I sit back, I pull in a deep breath, my chest aching against the tightness of my corset. Besides, I could use a walk, I tell them. Shall we? Of course, Clayton says without looking at me, and he opens the door, exiting first. He takes Scarlet's hand to help her step down, and I follow after. Clayton doesn't meet my eyes as he lets go of my hand, and it feels as if he's uncomfortable or angry with me for something, though I haven't the slightest notion what I've done. Thank you, I tell him, his back to me as he closes the carriage door. I angle to face him fully as he turns around, his eyebrows pulled together. For helping my father with the repairs this morning, I mean. And for the carriage? His lips part infinitesimally, then he lets out a deep breath. Of course, you're welcome, Miss Mason. It's the least I can do after. He shoves his hands into his back pockets and his brow furrows. Clayton, Scarlet says, eerily low. His eyes linger on me a moment longer, and I want to know what he's thinking, but he steps past me without another word. What's the marshal doing? Scarlet asks him, and I peer beyond the carriage at one of the caged wagons as the marshal climbs onto it a dozen yards ahead. The crowd surrounding him is thick, and their garbled murmurs carry to my ears. Clayton spares me a glance to offer me his arm. What is it? I ask him, squinting into the glaring sunlight. I haven't the slightest idea. His gaze is fixed ahead, and a terrible feeling overcomes me. The four of us move closer, straining to hear what the marshal is saying among the clamor. The marshal reaches down into the cage and uncovers something I can't quite see through the sea of people. The marshal's action is one I'm unnervingly familiar with, and I stiffen. Move aside, please, Clayton says as we draw closer. Some of the townspeople part for us to pass, others are too engrossed by what's before them to notice. When Clayton and I break through the crowd, we find Doyle and Carlyle flanking each side of the cart. A delicate arm hanging out from the back of it is the only thing unobscured. All I can think of is my dead mother and what little breakfast I ate churns in my stomach. I resist the urge to take a step backward. The way the marshal stares down at me with wide eyes is more than I can handle as the memories of a time long ago rise too close to the surface. Scarlet gasps. Someone who was trapped in the storm? She asks. Thieves the man beside her says. Doyle takes a step forward, a snarl pulling at his upper lip. These bastards were trying to steal from us, he shouts. We protected you, all of you. He paces a moment, the marshal eyeing him closely. Then Doyle stops to address the crowd again. If it weren't for us, you'd- Doyle, the marshal snaps, his tone reproving. Doyle settles down as his master commands, but his eyes skirt over us, still riled and untamed. The marshal looks out at the crowd, then at me. Let this serve as a reminder of how dangerous things are beyond our borders, he says. We're doing everything we can to patrol and keep everyone safe, but there will always be others trying to take what we have. Food, water, our homes. The marshal climbs down from the cart, unobstructing my view. And when I see a flash of impossibly dark hair, I step closer, too curious and horrified to ignore my alarm. 
Clayton takes my arm, cautioning me, but I push past him. I have to see them, I say, both revulsion and disbelief building in my throat. The couple from the canyon lie like mangled, caged birds, their faces bloodied and their clothes vastly different from when I'd seen them. Their furs are gone. They are naked and their faces disfigured, pale and bruised, their lips purple, and their bodies are contorted in a way that forces me to swallow the bile quickly rising in my throat. They were using the cover of the storm, Doyle says. We stopped them before it was too late. He's too proud and too boisterous. He's lying. They tried to take the last of our water. Knowing that can't possibly be true, I shake my head. They might have been natives to a land far away from here, but they weren't thieves. It's all lies, every word from their mouths. Everyone begins to clap for the marshal and his men, startling me. Miss Mason. I hear my name, a breath in the commotion. They thank the marshal and the deputies standing there for their protection. But my awe is of another sort, one that no one but me could possibly understand. Josephine, Clayton says firmly in my ear, you should not have looked. Come. He takes my arm to lead me away, but I snatch it from him. Don't touch me. I take a step backward, clutching my stomach. How deep does it all go? What is Clayton's part in all of it? Two young people, vibrant and alive yesterday, are now cold and dead and dressed up as players in this charade. If you'll excuse me, I say, barely able to tear my gaze away from them as I hurry out of the crowd, getting as far away from the marshal and the wagon as quickly as I can. My footsteps are hurried and my stride wide as I continue down the sidewalk, looking for a safe place to gather myself, a place to hide. The water... The couple from the mountain dead, now along with their village. The injured and dead deputies who return from week-long patrols. My father, my mother, me. Was there no end to the marshal's brutality? How noble and victorious the marshal always seems to be at the most convenient times, after sandstorms and in the cover of darkness. Or when there's no one but his men to see. The questions and accusations tumbling around in my head are insurmountable, and there is no one I can go to, no one I can tell. The high heels of my boots thump against the slatted sidewalk, quickening like the rhythm of my heart, though I have no idea where I'm going. You all right, miss? asks a familiar drawl, barely audible against the loud, incessant racing of my heart. I stop in my escape and find Toby leaning against the side of the building a few steps behind me. You look like you've seen a ghost. I peer back at the baying crowd as they rally for the marshal. More like the devil. Chapter 17, Joe. Toby stares at me, a pinch of concern on his mostly clean face. The devil, eh? He waves the fly away. I reckon there's lots of devils in this place. He looks browbeaten for a moment. I'm about to ask what troubles him when I hear my name. I turn around to find Ms. Reinhurst coming closer, her hair braided and hanging over her shoulder, a small purse with missing beads clutched in her hands. Is everything all right, Miss Mason? I'm surprised to see she's dressed for church. I'd completely forgotten about it. There have been too many surprises this week, and my head begins to ache. Not particularly, I admit, and lean against the side of the building. The stone is already hot from the sun. Truly, miss, you are very flushed. Come inside, out of the sun. I allow her to usher me past a few storefronts and into her bookshop. I'm not sure what else to do. I can't go back to the wagon, or be with Clayton, or see the marshal. They are too closely connected, and I'm not sure what to think about anything anymore. Toby follows us into the shop and shuts the door behind him. It's a bit cooler inside with the morning sun behind us, and it smells of old books, which I find comforting. Though it's dark inside with the drapes drawn to keep the sun out, I take in the small space, the low rafters of the ceiling and the books crowding the tight shelves that line the walls and cases staggered within. Enchanted, I step over to the wall shelves. I haven't been here in so long, I realize. Those are the nonfictions. 
Dottie says as I brush my fingers over them. There are history books, tomes about machinery and scientific discoveries, books on how to make cotton, and the art of beekeeping. The bindings of the books are torn and faded, some of them barely hanging on with dissolving adhesive. History of Expedition under the command of the captains Lewis and Clark. The works of Wolfgang Mozart. Common sense. All of these men changed the world, I whisper, and we are left with a monster. I stare at the bewitching covers, my mind a bit fuzzy. They ruined us all. Miss, Dottie says, stepping closer. Have a seat. You don't look well. I must insist. I shake my head as my dudgeon-induced haze begins to lift. Miss Reinhurst, I say urgently, where are your history books? I hurry down the rows, skimming the other bindings. Where are your local histories or newspapers? You know, archived materials from the shift? What you see in the library is what I have, Miss Mason. It's all that was left after the great fire that devastated the south end of town. The marshal brings me relics as men find sometimes, but the answers are here somewhere. I know they are. The answers? What else is out there in the world? I ask her, though I don't expect an answer. There has to be more beyond the Deadlands. The rest of the world is just forgotten, but it's not gone. I can't help my rambling, knowing there is more to explore, more to know about this place. Secrets hidden so that the marshal can play his games. I'm determined, Miss Reinhurst. Please help me. Dottie steps closer with a cup of water. I'm not sure I understand, Miss. It's something to do with the marshal, Toby explains. Not something, Toby. It's everything to do with him, I amend. I glance between Dottie and the young orphan boy as they stare blankly at me. I want to prove that the marshal is a liar and a murderer. I want to expose him to the people of this town, but I need more than my word against his. I need more than my scars. Even the deerskin pouch might not be enough, not yet. I need proof that there are towns, settlements beyond the Deadlands. We know there are drifters, so where are they coming from? Are there no correspondences, no old notes? I think of my great-great-grandma West's journal and rack my brain to remember what's in there. I know there is more than he's telling us. I have to find out what it is. Dottie's eyes widen and Toby whistles as he leans back against one of the freestanding bookcases. He has an amused look about him I'm not sure I understand. I know it sounds a little crazy, but I- It does, Miss Mason, Dottie says softly. No matter what horrible things the marshal has done, it's madness to cross him, especially for you. I straighten. Because I'm betrothed to his son? Well, that's precisely why I must. That wasn't my meaning, miss, she says, and tilts her head slightly as her eyes fill with sorrow. After what happened. After what happened, I repeat, my voice a distant whisper. Dottie wrings her hands before she continues. To you and your mother, miss. I blink at her as heat floods my chest and neck until I feel it in my cheeks. I drop the book in my hand. To me? I've never told a soul, outside of those who were there. I was too frightened as a child and too ashamed the longer the scars lingered. While my mother's death was covered up by the marshal, I only assumed anything anyone knew about me had been covered up too. How do you? Dottie hesitates a moment, sharing a quick glance and unspoken conversation with Toby. He frowns and she tilts her head to him. What you hear in this room stays in this room, do you understand? He crosses his arms over his chest and lifts his chin, as if the thought that he would tattle affronts him. But when his eyes shift to me, they are sad or perhaps frightened. Dottie turns to face me fully, her skirt swishing against a bookcase, but she straightens her shoulders, her height matching mine, and I stare into her eyes, waiting. Though it's been many years. I remember it like it was weeks ago. I'd just delivered a baby and was at Dr. Henderson's when Mr. Ashford rode into town with the marshal. He was drunk as a skunk. Mr. Ashford, he tried to help you, but... Help me? I ask, incredulous. I was only a child and he left me alone with that monster. He tried, miss. 
But after what the marshal did to your mother, the love of his life, Mr. Ashford and half of the men, they thought he'd gone mad. They were afraid of him. What? Dottie's eyes widen and her shoulders fall. The love of his life? I shake my head, scoffing at the idea. That's ridiculous. I take a step back, looking from Toby to Dottie. She was making no sense at all. She was caring for Clayton. That's the only reason my mother was there. But my certainty dwindles as sympathy puckers Dottie's brow. She lowers her chin, the words barely uttered. No, it wasn't, miss. The color drains from my face, and my chest rises and falls so fast I think I might faint. What are you saying? The moment she seems to hesitate, I grab onto her arm. Please, speak plainly. Tell me what you know, Miss Reinhurst. You can't say something like that and change your mind. Dottie watches me a moment, her hesitation turning to resolve, and she nods to a ratty, leather-backed chair against the wall. Perhaps you should sit down, miss, she says earnestly, and I'm too frightened to argue. She scoots another chair over from behind the counter and situates it beside mine. Before she sits down, she glances over her shoulder at Toby, who remains against the wall, unmoving. Tobias, fetch Miss Mason some more water. Go on now. Her familiarity with the boy surprises me, but he doesn't squirm at the sound of his full name, nor does he argue with her. Instead, Toby looks as if he's relieved to be sent away as he heads toward the back of the building. When Toby is out of earshot, Dottie sits beside me. I shouldn't be telling you this, Miss Mason. It shouldn't come from me, an old bookkeeper. But if you don't know by now, I'm not sure you ever will. She takes a deep breath, kindness and gratitude filling her steely blue eyes, making them shimmer. I owe you after saving my life last week. I didn't save your life, Dottie. I merely... She shakes her head. It's no matter. Let me get it out before I change my mind. She peers down at her wrinkly hands clasped tightly in her lap. Even as my insides feel like a tangled mess of dread, I appreciate the remnants of beauty from her youth and the regal lines on her face. Your mother and the marshal were sweethearts when they were young. My Marty was still alive then, and he was their teacher in school. He used to think they were much like we were when we were younger. This was when Byron, the marshal's father, was running sagebrush. My hands tightened to fists, and Dottie reaches out to clasp them with hers. They're soft, her touch gentle. That was before the marshal was who he is now. I don't understand why my father has never mentioned any of this, I say, a little breathless. Dottie shakes her head. Perhaps it's best that you ask him about this, Miss Mason, she recants. I don't want you to. I squeeze her hands tightly, earnestly. My father keeps many things from me, and I won't have this be one of them. There are too many secrets, Dottie, too many lies. I need to know what's happened in this town and why my family's in the middle of it. Please, I need to know. Though I can tell she thinks better of it. The desperation in my voice must sway her, and she sighs in defeat. It was probably 25 years ago, maybe longer now that time seems to run together. I remember the great upset when Byron refused to let the marshal marry your mother. He'd lost his eldest son at a young age, with only the youngest Cunningham, Marcus, to follow in his footsteps. Byron threatened to take everything from Marcus and leave him with nothing. He'd threatened that old man Doyle would take Marcus's place and Byron would banish your mother and Marcus from Sagebrush. Byron didn't care how in love Marcus was with the pretty red-haired girl. He didn't care about anything other than Marcus's rightful place and his duties to the family. Is that why the Doyles have always hated everyone? They think they're entitled to something? All I know, miss, is that your mother was just as devastated as Marcus was when they couldn't be together. It was no secret to anyone. My heart aches at the thought of him even touching my mother, and I force a deep breath. But then why kill her? It was after Marcus was forced to marry his first wife and take his father's place that your father began to court your mother. After that, the marshal, he changed. He became an angry man, and I assume much when I say this, 
but I believe he resented your father for having what he could not. But it's not as if he stole her away from him, I say, my mind reeling at the thought of my mother and the marshal in love, together, of her pining for him. No, of course it wasn't his fault, but I know from experience that a broken heart makes you do miserable things. He held on to jealousy and resentment toward his father. How could he not? Your father had freedom and your mother, everything Marcus wanted. It was only a matter of time before he broke. She lifts a shoulder, her head tilted as she stares through the bookshelf at a sad love story lost in a time long ago. Byron died soon after, but everything was already on a different course. The drought was the longest in sagebrush history. The storms began to worsen, and your mother seemed happy with your father. She watches me closely and lets all she's told me sink in. I can't even imagine the marshal, young and affectionate, compared to the man I fear now. I shake my head. But he killed her. Dottie looks at me as if she's waiting for me to understand something I can't possibly. The week she died was tumultuous. The town was in complete bedlam. A patrol had come back, some of the men dead and others in bad shape. People were very frightened and acting out. Not to mention the doctor had his hands full. And like you've done on occasion, your mother was helping him with the men critically injured. I vaguely remember the patrol coming back, half dead. I try to imagine a small, sickly Clayton, lying in bed, sweaty and pale, and I feel an unexpected sense of urgency. On top of everything, she continued, the young Mr. Cunningham had fallen ill, though I can't rightly remember what was wrong with him. He was about 10 or 11, I think, and your mother went to the Cunningham estate to do what she could for him. The marshal was in a ripe state, the future of his legacy on death's door. It was weeks after the fact, but Mr. Ashford told me all of it, she adds. He was the newest, youngest member of the marshal's deputies at the time. He had a new wife. He was happy. But then he got mixed up with the marshal and everything changed. There were rumors, Dottie continues, rumors that your mother and the marshal had become close again over the days she'd come to check on the boy. Mr. Ashford knows more than I do, of course. But even the servants had claimed there were nights your mother stayed with the marshal. She would never do that to my father, I bite out. I know she wouldn't. But Dottie doesn't apologize or retract her words. She simply waits for me to accept them before she continues. There was a storm on that final night. Mr. Ashford was stuck there, along with your mother. It's hard to say what happened behind closed doors, exactly but the marshal warned her not to leave, that things could never go back to how they had been ever again. She threatened to come home to us and he killed her for it? A tear rolls over my lashes and down my cheek. In a fit of jealous rage, perhaps. He'd finally gotten what he'd wanted, and she was leaving him after becoming close again. I wipe the tear away and shake my head. And what he did to me. That was not just to punish my father for his accusation, but to hurt him even more. The unshapen pieces of the past begin to take form. The night before she left, I'd asked to go with her. She'd always let me go on house calls with her until she started going to the marshals, never to the marshals. The shadow of the memory shreds through me. Not only was she intimate with the marshal, she still loved him too. Toby peeks around the corner before he re-enters the room, his holy boots scuffing against the floorboards. He hands each of us a cup of water and stares at me. I wipe the moisture from my cheeks and try to smile, though he doesn't react. His hair is mussed, his light brown eyes holding a familiarity I still can't put my finger on. What? he asks. How old are you? I ask, reaching for a clue. Twelve in a few months he says proudly, and his stance straightens. I blink a few times and wipe my eyes, both of them a watery vision. And how do you two know each other? Toby lifts his chin and looks to Dottie. She nods at him as if giving him permission. I take care of Dottie from time to time. Oh? I wasn't expecting him to say that. I flash Dottie a curious look. She shakes her head. And I get to care for him when he'll let me, she adds 
and Toby looks at her askance. Hmm. I take a sip of my water, still waiting for the pieces to fall together. That's kind of you, both, I add, glancing between them. It's just for a time, Toby says, and he puffs up his chest a bit. Until my father is ready for me. I take another sip of water. I thought you were an orphan, he glares at me. I never said nothing like that. He's getting things in order, and Dottie needs looking after in the meantime. Well then, I say, growing impatient, the suspense is killing me. Who's your father? Jonathan Ashford, Dottie says and gets to her feet. Come on now, they are going to wonder where you are, Miss Mason, and we should be getting on to church. It will start any moment now. Wait, what did you say? I look at Toby, recognizing the similar mouth and expressive brown eyes. Your father is Mr. Ashford, one of the marshal's closest deputies, and you're living in squalor on the streets? Toby shrugs. Ain't his fault, he's never home, but it's better this way. Finish your water, miss, Dottie says with motherly authority, and I don't argue. Then she takes my empty cup and hands it to Toby. Here, take these back to the kitchen, please, and run upstairs and get your satchel. Toby grumbles, but he does as he's asked and disappears down the hall again. His mama had an accident 11 years ago, she says quietly. Jonathan was in no state to care for a child on his own, not after the guilt of what had happened. So he abandoned his child, I nearly shriek, more disgusted with Mr. Ashford than ever. Careful, Miss Mason, I know you're a good woman. You're shrewd and too curious for your own good. But don't think for a moment that yours are the only people in this town that have been branded by fear and loss. Her tone brooks no argument and I shrink in my chair a little. The night Mr. Ashford brought you home to your father, he did so without the marshal knowing, miss. I'm only telling you because you asked for the truth, even if it hurts. Liquid fear pools in my stomach. The marshal's men went looking for you both, uncertain what Jonathan had planned to do. They knew he was against what happened from the beginning, so it wasn't hard for Doyle to figure out where you'd gone off to. They went to his house first and found his young wife who'd just had a newborn and I don't need to tell you the rest of it. My eyes burn and too many tears escape down my cheeks to feel them anymore. The marshal killed his wife. It's easy to believe, Miss Mason, I know, but no. Doyle's father made it very clear he was teaching Jonathan a lesson for his disobedience. The marshal sent old man Doyle out on a lot of patrols after that. As punishment? If it was, Jonathan never told me. But Toby's been with you ever since. Why? Dottie leans back in her chair, her brow furrowing in contemplation. As I told you, the years seem to wish by and blend together. At first I kept Toby out of fear of what they might do to him. But for one reason or another, I've kept him with me ever since. Well, when he'll come home, at least. She stares up at the ceiling, the sound of determined footsteps above us. Jonathan does what he can for his boy. He visits nearly every day, at least when he can. He has a good heart, and Tobias knows his father loves him, even if he doesn't fully understand why he can't be with him. He blames himself, I realize. He said he felt guilty after what he'd done. In taking me home, he risked his family's lives. I have to swallow my own guilt. It claws at me the way I wish it did the marshal. It aches and burns and writhes inside me until I can barely stand it. And they let Toby live? He was with me, miss. The men didn't touch him. I'd taken him to see Dr. Henderson the day he was born. He was having a difficult time breathing and the doc wanted to keep him for a while. Mrs. Ashford trusted me, you see. I try to wipe the tears from my eyes. You knew her then? She nods. Her mama was my best friend. I took her in like my own daughter after she died, since I never had one. I can't believe I've had Mr. Ashford wrong all these years. I remember when he brought me home, I tell her. The particulars have always been blurry in my semi-conscious memories. I didn't realize he'd taken me at the risk of his life, at the risk of his family. I have to choke back a sob. 
Toby is motherless because of me. Toby walks into the room, hands in his pockets, and I force myself to calm down and exhale my sadness, at least for now. Aren't you going to church? He says, and Dottie stands. Of course I am. Are you sure you don't want to come? Toby sticks out his tongue and shakes his head. Yuck, he grumbles. I'll pretend I didn't hear that, Dottie chides. But don't worry, I wouldn't dream of taking you into public with all that dirt covering your face. But you best be here for supper tonight. She nods to his satchel. And your father stopped by this morning, so I'm sending you to the market. She picks up her old clutch from the counter and pulls out a few coins. He takes the coins with a groan, but I think it's all for show. Then he heads for the door. I'll stop by Mrs. Pelly's first, he says, and peers back over his shoulder at me. She's fine, by the way, in case you were wondering. I nod and wipe the moisture from my cheeks. I'll leave more coins with Ms. Reinhurst. Spend some time with Mrs. Pelly, okay? He nods and pulls the door shut behind him. Dottie steps up to the window and lifts the drapes. The church bells chime, but I can't even think about going to church right now. You should go, miss, she says, eyeing the street. The crowd has dispersed. But there is so much more I need to know. I have so many questions, please. Come back this evening after closing, she says. Mr. Cunningham is coming. Just as she steps away from the window, the door opens and Clayton steps inside. Mr. Cunningham, Dottie says a bit breathily, how nice to see you again so soon. I'd forgotten he'd come to visit her to purchase some of my books. He nods to Dottie, but his eyes cling to me as he moves closer. He scans my face, takes in my red cheeks and eyes. I've been looking for you, he says, his voice a bit harried. She was in a bit of a fright, Dottie offers and glances between us. Her face is a perfect mask of stoic sincerity. There's distrust in his eyes as he glances between us. Are you feeling better? Yes, thank you. And Dottie, thank you for the water. I reach for two random books on a shelf. I would like to borrow these, if you don't mind. I will return them as soon as I'm finished with them. Of course, miss. She bows her head graciously, and Clayton steps closer. Are you sure you're all right? he asks, taking in my appearance. I know I can't hide my swollen face from him, so I don't bother trying. I won't lie, I was horrified seeing that couple like that, but I'm feeling a little better. I can almost detect a hint of relief in his eyes. You did seem very shocked. Should I be used to seeing dead people, Mr. Cunningham? I ask with annoyance. I don't like how closely he's watching me, or attentively. Of course not. His brow creases and he shakes his head, exasperated or worried or both. He offers me his arm. Shall I walk you back to your father? He was worried. We weren't sure which way you'd gone. He glances to Dottie. Can I escort you to church, Ms. Reinhurst? We're headed that way. She shakes her head. No, thank you, Mr. Cunningham. I'll let the two of you enjoy the morning together. Are you sure? I ask her, hoping she'll walk with us. She shakes her head again. I'm certain. She eyes me closely, foregoing the false but convincing smile she'd hinged in place. Then she offers a small wave and shuts the door. It's as if she's severed ties to all that was grounding me, and everything I've learned fully hits me. It's a miserable, overwhelming feeling that makes me hate and miss my mother all the more. We stroll slowly down the sidewalk, and I don't bother to ask Clayton why we're not rushing. I barely even notice at first. All that I've held tightly to for over 11 years is only a distorted truth, one I have to accept as I walk arm in arm with a stranger. Mr. Cunningham, I ask, looking at him. His gaze is fixed thoughtfully in front of us. What sort of marshal do you think you will be? I have to know. I have to see the truth in his eyes and hear it in his answer. His expression wavers and he lifts a shoulder, looking around Main Street like he's never really looked at it before. I don't know, if I'm honest. I've seen what it's done to my father all my life, how absent he's been and how increasingly distracted he becomes. I've been putting off thinking about it most of my life. And now? And now, here we are. Yes, here we are. 
we walk arm in arm, engaged to be married, with nothing but secrets and distrust built between us. We turn up Hill Street, headed toward the church. We pass a few merchants along the way, a lightning glass jeweler, a seamstress crocheting a tablecloth with woolen string. Though they both pretend to be busy, rearranging and meddling, I see their eyes shift over us, between us, lingering on Clayton and me as we pass. Ah, miss, an elderly woman brushes her hand over mine. Her eyes are beady and surrounded by thick, dark skin and deep wrinkles, but her toothless smile is kind, and her eyes, dark as they are, glisten. What a sight you are, she says, glancing between Clayton and me. He looks at me skeptically. I peer around at her herbs that hang from strings, dried and shriveled. A bowl of ginger root and a smoking bundle of sage leaves burn behind her. We don't need any herbs, Clayton says, nudging me to continue. But she takes my arm, her grip firm and her gaze unwavering. A gift, she says, handing me three leaves of aloe wrapped in string. For your back, she says, and my heart nearly stops. What? She waves goodbye as Clayton leads me further down the road. Clayton stares ahead, and though I'm not sure he heard her, I can't bring myself to ask him either. I stare at the ends of the aloe, freshly cut and glistening. How did she know? When I peer behind me, she's completely unfazed and haggling with another patron. Clayton clears his throat, but he says nothing. His silence is strange. This whole day feels so, so strange. We're silent for a few moments until he stops and looks at me. What would you do if you were Marshal, Miss Mason? I know you have an opinion on the matter. He crosses his arms over his chest and widens his stance like he's settling in for a story. I laugh. What would I do? Yes, I'd like to know. Well, I pause, trying to organize the onslaught of ideas. I would want people to live without fear, I say. Clayton chuckles. Drought, sandstorms, drifters. There's no such thing as living without fear, Miss Mason. His answer surprises me, and I can't help but glower at him. What about your father? What about the deputies who take what they want from whoever they want because they can? You aren't so blind that you've missed any of that, I should think. And we both know there is water. Clayton chuckles again, only this time I think he's less amused. Rightly so, Miss Mason. Thank you for putting it plainly for me. I would not want my sisters to ever fear that they would be mistreated or taken advantage of. Lucky for them, they have you, I say easily. I'm sure they will never know any of it. I can't help but wonder if little Izzy, or even Kitty for that matter, has any idea what a horrible man their father is. And I hope for their sakes that they never do. Chapter 18 Clayton. They have you. I'm sure they will never know any of it. Josephine's words haunted me all through church as I sat in the pew next to her with little Izzy kicking her feet anxiously beside me. And they haunted me after as I walked Josephine to the carriage and watched Sanderson drive her and her family away. They haunted me each time I passed the saloon debating going in. I can't erase the resolve and bitterness in her voice that still echoes in my mind. No, Izzy and Kitty will never know horrible things. But Josephine has, that much is clear. And that's a sucker punch to the gut I hadn't anticipated when I left for her farm yesterday, intent on seeing if I could patch things up. I had no idea what mess I was stepping into, but my father did. The carriage rumbles beneath me, jostling the image of Josephine sitting next to me on the way to church in her gauzy gown and her impossibly dark red hair that catches the sunlight. I want to know what happened to her mother and why Josephine is so angry. Everything feels altered now, and for the first time, I don't want to drink to blur it all away. I respect Josephine too much to dull my senses and hold myself away, hiding from a future I don't want. Especially while she still stands tall 
despite her animosity for what's been laid at her feet. And all of these years, I've known nothing about any of it. I need to know what my father's role in her scars was before I do something I might regret, because Josephine is right about one thing. I am so far removed from this place, I don't fully comprehend any of it. I don't even know what I will do as Marshall. It's careless, pathetic, it's selfish. My father was right then, too, it would seem. I have my sister's lives to think about, my mother's when my father is gone. I have an entire town that will look to me, and in my 21 years, I've done nothing to prepare myself for it. Long after the carriage jerks to a stop in the drive, I sit in silence, staring at an invisible Josephine and trying to reconcile the little girl with the sharp tongue from my childhood with the woman who tries and fails to hide the emotions in her eyes. The mortification, the disgrace, the hatred. I hate myself for my ignorance, and my fist collides with the side of the carriage in disgust. I'm in a web of secrets and dark shadows from a past I can't possibly change. I didn't know, I whisper, but that's my fault. Even the merchant in the market knew what had happened to Josephine, even if she didn't outright say it. I saw it in her eyes, through her gift. For your back. Sir, Sanderson says, peeking inside. Are you all right, sir? Ignoring him, I step out of the carriage and into the cooling afternoon air. The servants are already lighting the porch lamps in preparation for nightfall, and I notice a few horses tied to the porch railing as I head inside. My father's voice echoes through the foyer. Other voices accompany his, and I follow them into his study. Mr. Ashford, Shane, and Chance stand at my father's desk as he lowers himself into his chair. Masons, then tell me what you've discovered, my father is saying. Doyle sits in a chair in the corner of the room, twirling his pistol around his finger. Yes, sir, Ashford dips his head respectfully and passes me with a nod as he exits the room, the other two men following after him. I step inside, and my father looks from me to Doyle. When I glance at the deputy, he's staring at me with a contempt that heats my blood, and I clench my fists at my side. I have no tolerance for Doyle today, so I straighten and glare provokingly back at him. Get that smirk off your face and get out of here, my father says. My head snaps to him, but he's speaking to Doyle. Doyle's eyes round and his mouth pinches in anger. After a reluctant moment, he stalks past me and slams the door shut behind him. I thought you'd be at Hannah's tonight, my father says dryly, and he peers down at the papers on his desk. You thought wrong, I say, still eyeing the study door. I lower myself into the seat across from him, the setting sun warm against the back of my neck as it sets through the glass French doors behind us. So... Ashford is your spy? My father locks the drawer beside him with his skeleton key, and I wonder what he's still hiding from me. Spy? He asks, shoving the key into his pocket. He looks unconcerned and thumbs through a stack of papers on his desk. I eye him carefully. What would you call it? My father's laugh is an empty sound. It's not spying when the town is mine to protect. I see. That's something you'll learn soon enough. And yet, I say, exhausted by his games, you've been keeping things from me, important things. You say I'm to run this place someday, but you keep me in the dark. This place keeps you fed and out of the deadlands, he says evenly. He drops his papers and takes a sip from his glass. A whiff of whiskey bites at my nostrils. The good stuff, the only type he'll drink. And I wonder if it's his drink or his weariness that ashens his skin. Whatever it is you're getting at, 
Say it plainly, Clayton, he demands. You know how I despise riddles. The water. The marriage. Those bodies. If half of these people had enough brains between them, they would realize that you couldn't have gone out there in the middle of a storm to save everyone from two meager thieves, if that's, in fact, what they were. He steeples his fingers and leans back in his seat. I don't appreciate your tone. His bloodshot eyes and ragged appearance betray his indifference. Something heavy weighs on his mind. I know that haze he keeps himself steeped in. I know that feeling. He pours himself another splash of whiskey. Suddenly you don't trust me, he muses, and when he finally looks at me, there's some form of amusement in his eyes. Should I? I pop the knuckles of my fingers, needing to keep them busy as I picture Josephine's scars. My father, the marshal, whoever is sitting across from me now, turns his glass around and around on his desk. He breathes out what sounds like a year's worth of anxieties, only to be replaced with fatigue. Should you trust me? He repeats to himself. Perhaps the question is, should I trust you? What? Are you still engaged? He asks me, his tone urgent. Yes, but not for long. She won't have me. She's biding her time until she can figure a way out of it, and I don't blame her. She will marry you, he says sternly, staring at his glass. My jaw constricts. Scars bathed in moonlight. I jump to my feet. And you'll have your men hurt her if she doesn't? She doesn't care for me. In fact, I'm certain she hates me, no thanks to you. His lips twitch, and he eyes me with a warning. I'm not asking her to care for you, Clayton. I'm demanding that she do what's needed to be done and stop being so damn stubborn. He rises to his feet. If they would all do as they were told, I... You wouldn't have to maim someone? I stand, inches from his face, my blood and anger a raging storm as I consider how easily the threats roll off his tongue. Tell me what happened to her back, and don't you dare lie to me. The hardness in my father's eyes mists over, and his chest deflates. He braces his fists on his desk and stares down at its surface. Like my father and grandfather, I have done things I'm not proud of, he admits. You? My breath hitches in my throat. Oh, dear God, tell me it wasn't you, I demand. But his silence is blaring. My heart breaks. My esteem for my father shatters. Any remaining hope for understanding diminishes as I picture him, ever the brute, hurting Joe, hurting anyone like that. The man who taught me how to shoot how to fight until I could easily beat him, is now a stranger. The man whose eyes light up when his little girl throws herself into his arms is a monster. It was years ago, he utters quietly. I sidestep his desk and grab hold of his collar, shoving him against the wall. Why, I demand, what reason could you possibly have? He grips my wrists but says nothing, his nostrils flaring and his eyes shifting over my face. Tell me plainly. Tell me why you did this, or so help me God you will have no heir to inherit this foul, miserable place you sold your soul for. Although there's a momentary rage and surprise in my father's eyes, defeat fills them just as quickly. He doesn't argue. He doesn't fight. Sir? Two of his deputies rush into the room. My father holds up his hand. My son and I are just having a conversation, he rasps and waves them away. But my grip on him doesn't loosen. Slowly they back out of the room. My father's glazed brown eyes meet mine again. Tell me, I plea, my grip on him shaking. Tell me why. 
because I loved her, he finally shouts back at me. Remorse and sadness drip from his words as they crack, but all I can think about is Josephine. My stomach curls. You what? I loved her, he growls. I loved her, but Caroline chose him. After everything we'd been through, she chose them. My grip slackens, and my father finds some of his strength and hits my hand off his lapel. Though my hands fall away, I refuse to move. Caroline could have stayed. She wanted to. We were going to make it work, and then she changed her mind. His eyes glaze over, and I think he must be lost in a faraway memory until he looks at me again. I couldn't bear to lose her to him again. I scrub my hand over my face. You loved Mrs. Mason, the healer? I remember opening my eyes to find her sitting at the side of my bed many times while I was sick. The darkness that descended over our house shortly after her death was a gloom my parents never recovered from, though I never understood why. I take another step back, the truth knocking the wind from my lungs. I heard you two. You were fighting. I thought it was the fever. But the scars. I can't quite imagine it, what he did or why. But suddenly the details don't matter. They horrify me. I lurch toward him. You killed her and beat her daughter. I shove him against the wall again, my forearm pressing into his throat. A murderer, a monster. Though his body is tense and his hands fly to my arm, it's only a reflex and he doesn't fight against me. What the hell's wrong with you? You push me toward Josephine the entire time knowing how much she must hate me, how much she fears you. I'm just a pawn like the rest of them. Tears of anger burn the backs of my eyes, and I can barely think. Izzy's worried voice sounds in the other room, and I force myself off of him, pounding my fist against the wall instead. I think I might kill you if that little girl didn't love you so much, I tell him. He smiles, devoid of amusement. Please do it, he says. Put me out of my misery. He's so apathetic I wonder if he's gone mad. Don't tempt me. I seethe and turn away from him. You think you have me figured out? He says, raising his voice. He reaches for his glass of whiskey and swallows it with one gulp. You think I'm the problem here? He glares at me, his nostrils flaring, and his eyes hardened like sunburnt sandstone. I'm trying to protect that girl. What's going on in here? My mother glances between us. Her face turns white as she takes in our heaving chests and brows dotted with perspiration. Izzy peeks her head around my mother's skirts, and I immediately step further away from my father. Unable to be around him a moment longer or control what else I might do in front of Izzy, I stalk around the desk and out the door. I don't utter a single word or look at any of them as I fling the front door open and disappear into the night. My life and all I thought I knew completely shattered in mere minutes. Chapter 19, Joe. Did you know Elizabeth West fell in love with a Cunningham? I asked Dottie as I set the books I'd borrowed earlier on the counter. I never once opened them. I realized it today when I was reading through her journal again. My mother's own great-grandmother falling in love with the marshal at the time. Now I'm to be married to Clayton. It's as if our families have been faded. Now I didn't realize, Dottie admits. I can feel her eyes on me as I pace the room anxiously. What if we all stood against the marshal and his men together? I think aloud ignoring my heavy boot steps back and forth through the room. We'd have to rally everyone, but what if we did? He would be powerless against hundreds. Dottie regards me with sympathy, and her eyes flicker in the candlelight. I want her expression to harden with anger and determination, not resignation. I don't know, miss. 
You say others know about his violence, but did they know about the water? That there has been a stream all this time and he's kept it from us? I wave my hand around her bookstore. And where does he get these old books and relics he lavishes people with? I stop in front of her, my words urgent as I take her hands in mine. He's killed innocent people, Dottie, and he wants to make us think the world beyond this place is so terrible. But what if it's not? He's murdered and lied and done awful things, and now he's making me marry his son. It's too much to bear anymore, and I shake my head. I can't. I bite my tongue to quell the tears. The truths I've learned today throb inside my head and constrict my throat until I can barely breathe. He's taken my childhood, my mother, and my memories, and now he's trying to take my future. He's stolen everything. Dottie wraps her arms around me, surprisingly comforting and warm. Shh, shh, Miss Mason. I know it's a lot, and I know it's hard. This life is not kind. It never has been. My head feels heavy and rests easily on her bony shoulder as she rubs my back, offering me her friendship, her strength. I inhale the scent of her, the aroma of books, a tinge of lemon, and a hint of ginger. I know it's not ideal, she says and gently pulls away, but there are far too many deputies and dangerous men in the marshal's pocket to risk angering him. Think of the innocent people, like Mrs. Pelly, who would be in grave danger if he cut off the water supply. Think of how many men walked the streets of this town already looking for trouble and what chaos would follow without a leader, without their fear of the law. Sagebrush has never been without a marshal. Then we pick someone else, I tell her. I know where the water is, Dottie. If everyone did, there would be nothing to hold over them anymore. Dottie squeezes my hands. Miss, I know you're confused and trying to take the pain away, but haste and anger will only get you in trouble. My hope quells at her words. At least Mr. Cunningham is a decent man, not a danger like his father. He might even protect you and your family from the marshal and his men if you were to marry. I drop my hands from her. Clayton doesn't even want to be marshal. He doesn't care about any of it. No one will take him seriously. He can't protect me. On the contrary, miss, Mr. Cunningham is a fighter, and he's respected among his peers at least. He has a kindness to him, and despite his past, he bears the Cunningham name. Fear and respect will follow. He's a drunk and careless, yet people will accept him blindly, I mutter, all because of his family. It's the way it's always been. It's all everyone knows. No one understands, I realize. Dottie has her books to keep her sane. I will have nothing, not my sister nor my ranch. I won't even have a husband to share a bed with. All I see are lonely days and lonelier nights waiting for him to come home knowing where he's been and smelling the nauseating perfume of other women on him. I will be beholden to him and his father, and I will not survive it. I believe, Dottie says wistfully, you might have more power than you think in marrying him. As the marshal's wife, you could make Sagebrush better again. I laugh, if a little hysterically. You pin the well-being of Toby and yourself in this place on hopes and uncertainties. I begin to pace the room again. This is my life, I breathe. There has to be a way out of this. There has to be something I can do. Something you can do, miss? Yes, me. You're right about the town. They would only be in danger, and the majority of them would be too frightened to act against him. I meet her brooding blue gaze, refusing to ask her to risk more than she already has for me, and determined to keep Toby, Mr. Ashford, and any other innocent out of it. All of them have already been scathed by the transgressions of my mother, but no more. I won't ask anyone to help me. Help you do what? She grinds out. I continue pacing. I don't know yet, but I will think of something. Someone has to do something, and it should be me. I hold some of the cards, after all. I just have to figure out how to play them. Don't be foolish, miss, she says, stalking up behind me. I don't have to remind you, of all people, that you are tempting the devil. Jonathan says the marshal hasn't been himself. He's changing, going a bit mad. You understand what I'm saying? 
He's getting things in order, in order, and never sleeping. He's drinking himself into darkness, the way he did that night 11 years ago. She lowers her voice. Miss, if you bring attention to yourself, I'm afraid he'll do worse this time. I grip her shoulders, willing her to understand. Do worse than what? I ask her, resolved. I'm already in his sights, Ms. Reinhurst, don't you see that? And I'm tired of my family and everyone else being his pawns. Dottie spins away from me, her skirt rustling as she walks back to the counter. I shouldn't have told you anything. Her words surprise me as she braces her palm on the counter and turns to face me. Had I a grandmother, I should think she'd chastise me with a reprimanding glare the way Dottie does now. I wanted you to know the truth, but not at the risk of your life. You can be angry, miss, and you can be hurt, but you can't change the past. And thinking you can save this town single-handed is ludicrous. Your family needs you. Don't forget that. A lifetime of anger fills her words, sobering me. I'm tired of good people getting hurt because of jealousy and selfishness and greed. Don't be like the marshal and his men and risk your life and your family all for some sort of retribution. There are worse fates than being Clayton's wife. Perhaps it's time for you to start thinking how you'll use it to your advantage instead of taking on a man you can't possibly defeat or understand. I blink at her. I want to be offended or hurt, but I'm too stunned, too conflicted. It's all so close I can almost feel it. Relief, a sense of freedom. My father has lived in fear every day since my mother's death, and I want to relieve him of waking up each morning, wondering what the marshal has in store for him. Then again, I've already seen what the marshal is capable of. I know it could be worse. I know Dottie speaks the truth. And it stings like sand on a fierce wind to think I could be the cause of even more pain and heartache. The nascent fire in me dwindles, and my resolve weakens. Dottie clears her throat. Now, quickly, ask me what you need to know. You should not be here this late. People will start to wonder. I had a thousand questions earlier. But now, all I can think about is how foolish it was to come here. I don't know what I was thinking. There's a knock at the front door, and I jump. Dottie hurries over to it. It's just Jonathan, she says, and unlocks the door. Mr. Ashford steps inside, and when he sees me standing between two bookshelves, his eyes widen. Miss Mason, he says, shifting a wrapped parcel from one hand to the other. He swallows. As always, there's a disquiet in his eyes, only this time I see it for what it really is. Is everything all right at the ranch? He asks, taking a panicked step closer. You should not be out this late. I nod and brush the palms of my hands over my pants anxiously. Yes, I assure you everything is fine. Scarlet is fine, I add for him. I just had something to return, that's all. He looks at Dottie as if he's waiting for confirmation, and I feel a sharp prick of sadness as I realize this has been his life all these years. Worrying watching, regretting. All is well, Jonathan, Dottie says reassuringly. Tobias is upstairs in his room. We were just chatting. She shoves her key back into her pocket and returns to the counter, leaving Mr. Ashford and me standing a few feet from one another. Determined, I step closer. I stare at his feet for a breath, drawing the courage to say what needs to be said, though it already hurts to think about it. Licking my lips, I notice a man almost ten years my senior, whose life has been so intricately woven with mine and riddled with a pain I never knew anything about. What is it, miss? He asks quietly and hesitates to lean in, perhaps to comfort me in some way, and my heart breaks for him even more. I want you to know, I start, taking a deep breath. I want you to know that I am sorry for what happened those years ago and every cruel remark since, and that I am indebted to you and I don't know how to thank you. No, he says. He straightens and shakes his head. No, miss, do not thank me. Please let me finish, I beg him and exhale a breath. He's the only person who truly knows what it was like, the one who risked his life for me and lost everything. I have treated you badly, 
when I know you were trying to help me. I've been so angry with you, not wanting to see the truth, not knowing what you've lost because of me. I am so sorry for everything. No, miss, he says more fiercely. Please don't say another word. I don't blame you. You should, I whisper. His eyes widen. But you were only a child. I wish. Please, Miss Mason. His words are a plea I know I must respect, so I say nothing more. It's the least I can do. I take a step back, wiping the tears from my face. My sister does not know how lucky she is, I tell him. He clears his throat and nods, a silent thank you. Dottie steps over to me, her hand slowly reaching for my arm. You should go, miss. It's late. I meet Mr. Ashford's glassy eyes one last time, then follow Dottie to the door. We exchange a brief farewell and I step out into the warm night. Only after the door closes behind me do I allow myself to gulp in a lungful of air and try to catch my breath as I head toward Duke, tied up outside the old billiards room with the other horses. It's as if a huge weight has been lifted, a pressure on my heart and in my mind that I didn't realize was there. Knowing I'll have to explain my absence to my father and Scarlet when I get home dampens my buoyancy a little, but as Dottie so passionately put it, it could be worse. I peer around Main Street, at the remaining folks meandering the streets and the lanterns flaring between shadows. Muffled conversations, laughter, and saloon music fills the still night, and I find it's almost pleasant. But even in the sultry evening, a chill trickles down my spine and over my skin. I quicken my steps, suddenly filled with a terrible feeling that someone is watching. Chapter 20 Clayton I drain the rest of my whiskey and slam the empty glass down on the bar. It tastes like ash on my tongue, but I motion to Tucker, the bartender, for another one anyway. My father is a murderer. That's not something I want to deal with right now. Evening, sugar. Cora's voice is a rake against my skin. She saunters over, looking worse for wear, but maybe I'm just not drunk enough to appreciate her yet. She stops beside me, the heat of her body almost stifling, and she runs her fingertip down my spine. It would have been a welcomed gesture in another life. Then she leans in and purrs in my ear. You sure look pitiful sitting here all by your lonesome. The stale, sickly sweet scent of jasmine fills my nostrils, and I resist the urge to push her away. Not tonight, I tell her, and polish off another drink. The burn of it is long gone, but it begins to dull my senses. Is something wrong? I don't think I've ever seen you looking so glum. I let the piano music and drunken banter in the saloon drown out my thoughts. I don't want to think. I simply want to drink. I swallow another mouthful and stare down into the chipped glass. You even listening to me? Cora's hand rubs circles on my back, testing and provoking me with another distraction I don't want. There are dark circles beneath her eyes, and she's wearing a red wig tonight that rubs me the wrong way. Take a break, Cora, I tell her. She's dirty, she's exhausted. She's a puppet, just like me. She pouts but leans in, providing the perfect view of her breasts, her only good feature, I realize. I can make it all go away, Clay. You know I can. She shimmies and runs her claw-like fingers through my hair. I grab her by the wrist. I said not tonight. Find another fool. She straightens with a huff. Drunk bastards, she mutters and stomps off. My gaze follows her over to the stairs, where she whispers something to Miss Hannah, and soon they are both staring at me. I don't care what Cora is saying, and apparently Hannah doesn't either because she points to a patron sitting at the poker table and orders her off. Hannah nods at me as if she's done me a favor, and I turn back to the bar. My glass is suddenly full again, thanks to Tucker, 
and I swirl the amber liquid around and around. It looks like piss, smells like it too, and I take another gulp. Despite my attempt to drown out the noise in my head, the images of Josephine don't disappear. They only blur. It hurts to think about any of it, and I let the last of the whiskey slide down my throat and fill my belly, glad to focus on something else, something in my control. God damn, you're on a roll tonight, Tucker says as he makes his way over to me, a bar cloth in his hand. You want another? He's a short, stocky buck I knew from grade school, and he lifts the bottle before I even respond. Something's sure eating at you. This is your fourth drink in under an hour, and you ain't even looking at Cora or the girls. He pours me a shot of whiskey and leans over with an amused sort of sympathy. Rough day? If you only knew. I stare down at his hands, rough and calloused, those of a working man, a free man. I bet the marshal was celebrating another victory after getting those drifters. And a woman this time, that was unexpected. He shrugs. But now that we know there's more water, I guess more of them coming this way is expected. Say, how close is it anyway? I glare at him. Tucker and I might be friendly, but we're not friends. Never mind, he says and shakes his head, amused. You know, Stan Wilson was here last week, drunk as a skunk and chatting it up. He wasn't making much sense at the time. I thought for sure he was blasted, talking about a spring. You should have seen that drunkard's face when Doyle came in with a slew of deputies and beat Stan to shit. Still don't know why he did it. Probably some deputy business. But he was right about the water, though. He pours himself a shot and lifts it up. Here's to hoping that problem is solved. One of many, I mutter. Tucker takes his shot and leans against the bar. Uh-oh. He nudges me with his elbow. Is it Mason's daughter that has you all in knots? I heard about the engagement. In fact, I was surprised to see you walk through the door. Well, I thought for sure she'd tied you down already. He shrugs. Meh, maybe not. She's singular enough. He waggles his eyebrows. I bet she's even more of a tart than they say. Doyle and his boys have told me stories, and I'd like to see. I grab Tucker by the collar and yank him down until his chin cracks on the bar top. Don't speak of her, I snarl. Don't utter her name, do you understand me? I press his face against the bar, my arms quivering with rage. Tucker's eyes are wide as he attempts and fails to nod. He swallows, a gurgling sound escaping him. I, I didn't, I didn't mean anything by it, he rasps. I swear. Good, I growl and swallow the whole of my drink. I knock my stool over as I stand, a little shaky on my feet. I don't want to be here. Miss Hannah comes toward me, calling my name, but I walk out, ignoring everyone's stares. The night air is warm, but there's a breeze, and I go where it wills me. I have no destination. I have no idea what I'm going to do about my father. I just walk and try not to think. It's impossible. The marriage is a sham. My future as the marshal is already wobbling. Josephine will resent me forever if I force her to marry me. I would hate myself. She's been beaten. She's been tortured. And I don't know what else. And yet, sometimes I see more curiosity in her eyes than anger. Something that gives me hope. And a trait that I admire. Until now, I've never been curious. She's a recluse and yet still knows more about this town than I do. She sees life and people so much differently. As unexpected as it is, being Marshal with her by my side suddenly seems possible. I walk along the street, the edges of the world blurred. A few pedestrians walk about and horses clomp through the street. The town is mostly shut up for the night, metal shutters hiding windows and covering doors. It's a metal cage, one we can't leave and one we inevitably won't survive, and the thought makes me nauseous. 
The sidewalk creaks beneath my steps, and I think how many times I've stumbled this way, oblivious to the world around me. Now I have to stop myself from going to Josephine, a drunken mess. I want her to know how sorry I am, how angry, even though I know it won't change anything. A couple argues ahead, though I don't pay much attention. I don't want to lose her. It's a surprising thought, one that stops me as I step off the curb. There's a scuffle, and I peer into the shadows of the alley. To ruin you before he does, a man growls, and I sober a little. There's a flutter of arms against the side of the building. Get off me, a woman shouts, then curses. You're not untouchable, he rasps, pinning her arms against the brick siding. I'll show him. Hey, I shout hoarsely and step closer. I try to shake the liquid haze from my head. No, get off! She growls as she knees him. Then, I register her leather trousers and freeze, confused. Bitch, I want a better look at you. He laughs and grips her chin, pushing it up to fully expose Josephine's face as he presses it against the building. Let go! She struggles, a cry finally escaping her throat. Get the hell off her! I roar, moving faster than I expect my legs would carry me. Rage thrums through every fiber as I pull him off, my fist colliding with the man's jaw before he knows what's happened. Caught by surprise, he wavers on unsteady feet, and I punch him again, my fist skimming his temple as he stumbles to the ground. Son of a fucking bitch, he spits. My hand sings in pain, and Josephine whimpers behind me. I whirl around, reaching for her as she bends over to catch her breath, but she cowers away. I turn on her attacker, and am met with a scowl I know all too well. In the moonlight, Doyle's eyes fill with surprise. Then, cruel amusement. You worthless piece of shit, I shout at him. Before he can reach for his gun, I pull mine from behind me and cock it, aimed right at his face. His hands go up, but I know he's not so easily defeated. You attack my fiancé, I growl. It takes every bit of control I have not to pull the trigger as I press the barrel of my gun into his head. I reach for his pistol, removing it from his belt, and aim them both at him. Doyle spits a mouthful of blood, and his scowl turns into a sneer. Whiny little rich boy who doesn't even deserve to be Marshal. Your woman doesn't even want you. Why don't you stop hiding behind your gun so we can settle this like men? My fingers tighten painfully around each pistol grip, and I push him back onto the ground with my foot. You touch her again, and I will kill you, you son of a bitch. Do you understand me? Get the fuck out of here. With a murderous gleam, Doyle shakes his head and climbs to his feet. You shouldn't have done that, he says, lip curled. He stares at both of the guns in my hands and wipes the blood off his mouth. His eyes narrow to slits, and he looks from me to Josephine before he clumsily stalks away. Then he disappears around the corner, out of sight, and I can finally catch my breath. I hear quiet footsteps beside me and turn to Josephine. She regards the guns as I stare at her busted, bleeding lips. Are you all right? She asks, reaching for my hand. She pries Doyle's pistol from my fingers and tosses it to the ground without hesitation. She examines the blood, turning my hand over in hers frantically. Her hands are rough against mine as she gently pokes the tender flesh. I heard a crack. I wince and pull my hand away from her. I'll be fine, I tell her, eyes latching onto her bruising face. Her hair hangs messily from its bun, and her chest is still heaving. What about you? Are you all right? Her eyes widen, and she takes a small step away from me. He, he was waiting for me to come around the corner, and I... I register her torn shirt, 
speckled with blood, and reached for her, searching her body for more injuries. Did he? I'm all right, she says, tentative as she steadies my shaking hands. Our chests heave between us, our eyes locked in a reassuring silence. Thanks to you, anyway. What the hell are you doing out here, alone? I ask, my voice harsh with another swell of worry. Look what could have happened. Are you so foolish? I beg your pardon? You're here this late and alone? It's the most reckless thing you could do. The confusion widening her eyes angers me. How could you be so naive? I run my fingers through my hair and take a step back, my adrenaline racing, burning its way through my body. Jesus, Josephine, what would have happened had I not been here? What are you doing out so late? That's none of your concern, she snaps. I throw my hands in the air with a sharp laugh. I just saved your life, and it's none of my concern? Unbelievable. Josephine scoffs. Saved my life? Your virtue, then. You, the most notorious rake in Sagebrush, are forcing me to marry you, and you're worried about my virtue? She hurls more accusations at me. Think you can... But all I can think about is the image of her with Doyle's hands on her breasts, his knee between her legs. Do you know what he would have done to you? I shout. My voice carries more anger than fear. What he would have done? I appreciate your help, Mr. Cunningham, and how noble you think you are. But, with all due respect, your family has taken away my free will, my dignity, my mother, and my happiness. She shakes her head as if she's about to explode. And you're upset about my virtue? Though she's trembling with a pent-up rage that renders me speechless. You are such a bastard, she says hoarsely, a silent tear streaming down her red cheek. You and your father can go to hell. I don't try to stop her as she storms off. Chapter 21. Clayton. In the early hours of morning, after too much pacing and petulant brooding about what Josephine and I could but might never be, I decide enough is enough. Without breakfast or changing my clothes, I ride for the farm. Taking the back roads where I can, I race across town, oblivious to the looks and curses people shout as I rush by them. Josephine would never be happy with me. That much is clear. She can blame me for things out of my control, and she can question my motives all she wants. But I'm not my father, and I won't allow her to be right about that. Jules fights against me, pulling against the reins as though she's warning me to slow down. But I can't slow down. I don't want to. The engagement is off, and Josephine needs to know. I ignore how irritated the pull and tug of my decision makes me and push Jules harder. We ride down the dusty road toward the farm, cacti and shrubbery meeting the graying sky for as far as the eye can see. Only when the outstretched arms of the mesquite trees that mark the Mason property come into view do I begin to pull back on Jules's reins, giving her enough space to breathe. There's a storm coming, I can see it creeping closer but I don't care. Even if being locked in a house with her this time will be more difficult, I have to get this out or risk losing myself to a weakness I can feel inching its way in. More intrigued by her than ever, I know I'm not ready to give her up, but I can't be selfish in this. I can't be selfish in anything, not anymore. And I refuse to let her hate me so easily. A cloud drifts over the sun as the Mason's farmhouse comes into view, peeking up over the hilltop. Mr. Mason stands on the porch, his expression harried as he talks to Ashford, mounted on his horse. I nod to them as I pull Jules to a halt, then pat her neck and dismount quickly. Clayton, Mr. Mason says as I glance around, looking for Josephine. I see a few of the farmhands rolling the giant steel doors shut around the greenhouses, but I don't see her. If you're here to call on Miss Mason, Ashford says, she's gone. 
What? I frown, feeling nearly as out of breath as Jules. She took fresh flowers to her mother's grave at the old cemetery an hour ago, and she hasn't come back yet. He nods to the east, toward the Deadlands. The blue sky is dissipating, and it's only a matter of time before the storm reaches us. She's a smart girl, Ashford says for Mr. Mason's benefit. She's on her way in, I'm sure of it, but I'm going to ride out just in case. I glance out at the horizon again, but there's no sign of her. I jump back up on Jules, who's already exhausted, but I know she can make it. I'll find her, I tell them, and just as I'm about to kick Jules into a run, Ashford shouts at me. I look back as he tosses me a sand cape and headgear. I fumble to catch them, and Jules prances uneasily in place, but I nod and shove them between me and the saddle horn. Be careful, Mr. Mason calls, and I kick Jules into a gallop. We head down the dirt road on the outskirts of the property. The exact location of the old graveyard is a little hazy in my memory, but I'm certain I can find it. We pass three giant greenhouses, larger than the farmhouse, with pitched glass roofs and some of my father's men walking in from the fields, eyeing me curiously. Some of them file into what appear to be underground bunkers, which makes sense, and I search their faces as best I can for Doyle. I'm not surprised when I don't see him, not after I'd cursed my father with what few breaths I could manage in his presence when I told him what Doyle had done and to get his men under control. Leaving the farm behind me, Jules gallops on. It's only a matter of minutes before I'm the farthest I've been from sagebrush in years. The last time was for Mrs. Mason's funeral, which I attended with only my mother. Now, I wonder if my mother knew the whole time what sort of woman had saved my life, and how she'd come to her end. If she'd known or been jealous, She'd never let on to me. The wind grows stronger, stinging my eyes and blurring my vision until I can barely see. But I urge Jules faster, our time quickly running out. I struggle to pull the goggles on as Jules rides harder and clench my legs around her middle to steady myself. Haphazardly, I wrap the cloak around me as I scan the sandstone for caves and safe havens, knowing we'll have to wait out the storm somewhere if I don't find Josephine soon. As I round one of the sandstone pillars, my anxiety doubles. Wind-eaten tombstones litter the area, but there's no one around. Miss Mason, I shout, drawing closer. Jules clomps through the crumbled headstones as I peer around anxiously. Josephine! My voice is muffled under the cloth covering my face, but it's no matter. The sky is bronze now, the wind whipping the sand in small twisters around us, stinging my exposed skin. There's no horse, no rider. My last hope shrivels to terror as I realize she's not here. Damn it! Jules needs no encouragement from me as we gallop back the way we came away from the encroaching storm. My mind spins, my thoughts a jumbled mess of what-ifs and this can't be happening. My shirt whips against my body as we run as fast as we can back to the house. I must have missed her somehow. She'll already be home when I get there. She has to be. I notice a narrow, freshly worn path that veers toward the canyon, and I contemplate following it when I see Josephine on her horse, winding their way out of the sandstone, her cloak whipping behind them as they race against the wind. She does a double take when she sees me, then waves for me to follow her. My heart soars with relief, and my horse sprints behind hers toward the house. I don't think we're going to make it, but I know we have little choice this far from cover. Holding out my reins, I give Jules as much room to move with her strides as possible as we reach the final stretch to the farm. Josephine veers to the left, away from the homestead, but I don't hesitate to follow. Almost immediately, I see part of the old railroad, at least what remains of it, a rail covered in sand barely showing in places. 
a few crumbling boxcars are broken down along it. She passes the first two train cars, only slowing when she nears one at the base of a sandstone. It's haphazardly reinforced with sheets of steel, and only its base is buried in the sand. She barely pulls her horse to a stop before she's jumping off and running to the metal door. I do the same, rushing over to help her haul the rusted sliding door open. The wind is so violent and the door so heavy, I have to push all my weight against it before it finally budges. Josephine grabs the horse's reins, and in a few rapid heartbeats, she has them inside and helps me heave the door shut behind us. Once we're safe inside, enveloped by the sound of our heavy breathing and the howling, angry wind, the tension eases from me, and I'm able to take a deep, steadying breath. I unwind the cloth around my head, remove my goggles, and peer around the train car. Its long interior is reinforced with steel beams, and there are multiple compartments. I step further in. There's a pallet of blankets on the floor in the corner, a couple of books covered in dust beside it, and two candles discarded beside them. Josephine unwinds her headscarf, her expression perplexed to say the least, as she catches her breath. I try not to stare at her swollen lip and turn back to her hideaway. Stay here much? I ask her, thwarted by yet another reminder of how little I know her. Though I'm grateful for this place. For her. She rescued me. The horses snort and fidget in the small space, their heavy breaths loud like the wind. When Josephine doesn't answer me, I turn around. Her eyes are wide with surprise and perhaps confusion. And she shakes her head. What are you doing out here? Chapter 22, Joe. Outside, the wind is an eerie, ominous song as it whistles and moans, trying to break through the shoddy metal armor plated around us. Inside, panicked horses paw at the floorboards and their bridles clank together as they bite and pull at their bits. Clayton stares at me, chest heaving, as I realize we're stuck inside the boxcar together. I pull my goggles off and unwrap my face. What are you doing out here? I rasp, my lungs still clawing for air as the adrenaline dies away. I came to find you, he says, though he seems uncertain. White rings slowly fade from around his eyes in the absence of his goggles. You mean to save me from the storm? I clarify, and I find myself holding my breath despite the burn in my lungs. I'm not sure why exactly, but the distinction matters to me. Reluctantly, he offers a curt nod and places one hand on his hip, his chest still rising and falling as he breathes forcefully through his nose. He peers around the train car and lifts his shoulders. But it would seem that you didn't need me to, though I have to say you cut it pretty close. The wind howls, and when he looks at me again, I'm sure I'm staring, thinking, overthinking. I've been dwelling on last night, him, wondering what turned his worry to anger and if he'd meant everything he said about my safety and my virtue. Did he truly care, or was it the whiskey on his breath? Simply the adrenaline of the moment, or a possible affection? Miss Mason, he says, leaning closer with sapphire eyes nearly as wild now as they were last night in the moonlight. I asked you if you stay here often. I nod and peer down at the layer of sand on the ground. Sometimes, I tell him, when I need to. Our horses shuffle, antsy in the storm, and I collect Duke's reins. The horses can stay in this anteroom, down here. I lead Duke through the narrow train car and hear Clayton's horse clomping behind me. I navigate around the rotted spots in the floor the best I can, uncertain how I feel having Clayton here after last night. It makes me uncomfortable, but he's not entirely unwanted, which surprises me. I clear my throat. They must have converted this to a caboose for the workers, I say in the awkward silence. I think this was their sleeping quarters, though there's nothing left of it, really. I bring Duke to a stop in the corner of the caboose 
and rise to my tiptoes to drape his reins around an exposed iron beam I can barely reach. Here, Clayton says, taking them from me. A half foot taller than me, he easily reaches the beam to loop Duke's reins around it, then his mares a few feet further down. The horses shuffle, their ears turned back and their wide eyes assessing the foreign quarters that will be their temporary stall. I pull Duke's face down to me, whispering reassurances to him as I stroke his jaw and under his chin. His breath is hot against me, labored but steadying. I run my fingers through his dark forelock, waiting for him to calm. I found this place a couple years ago, I tell Clayton. My sister and I were headed to my mother's grave. It was our first time leaving the farm without my father, but he'd stopped coming as frequently as we'd wanted. He said as long as we had Kip and the shotgun, he would allow us to go. I shake my head at the memory. Of course, Kip ran off. I don't remember what he was chasing, but we found these old boxcars. Clayton looks at me, the harness of his bridle clipped around his horse's neck. I remembered it last year when I was out by myself. A dust storm picked up. Not like these, not as bad, but enough to scare me. It was the only place I could think to hide. And you've been maintaining it ever since, he says, nodding to an exposed portion of the metal siding. I uncinched Duke's saddle, offering him a slight reprieve and nod. Pretty much. And your father doesn't wonder where you sneak off to or where you disappear with sheets of metal? And, he leans closer, are those horseshoe nails? Would you rather I brought a blacksmith all the way out here? He chuckles to himself and shakes his head. It's the imagery that's intriguing, Miss Mason. My father doesn't notice much of what I do, I tell him. Clayton removes his mare's saddle, her white and sorrel hair matted with foam and sweat. My heart flutters to think how far they might have raced to find me. Anyway, I continue, your father supplies us with whatever we need for this place, so when things go missing, no one really seems to care. I see. He regards me from the corner of his eye, then reaches for Duke's saddle, pausing as he waits for my permission. I nod. Yes, thank you, I say, and Clayton sets it in the corner on the floor by his. His mare's breathing has finally slowed. She's beautiful, I tell him, admiring her painted coloring. Thank you, Clayton says absently and pats her neck. I walk over to my saddlebag and pull out the deerskin pouch I found at the stream, filled with water. Here, I toss it to him and reach behind me to a pail I'd brought after the first time I was stuck here for nearly six hours. I hand it to Clayton and nod to his horse. Give her some. Clayton stares at the deerskin, then pours a bit into the pail. Thank you. She slurps the water up greedily, and I nod for him to do it again when her pail's empty. When she's finished, he does the same for Duke. Jules, he says, as Duke nearly knocks the pail from his hands. Her name is Jules. Matches her blue eyes, I note, and reach into my bag and pull out another canteen, a smaller one, and take a drink before I hand it to him. For us humans, I clarify. Shouldn't we ration it, he asks. There's another in the other room. Plus, there's the stream, I remind him. Clayton looks at me, though I'm not sure if he's forgotten about the water or if he thinks I might have. We'll take them there to drink when the storm's over. Clayton's eyes don't leave mine as he takes a sip from the canteen. He hands it back to me and puts the empty deerskin back into my saddlebag. I untie my shotgun and lead him to the front of the train where there's something comfortable to sit on. It's mostly loud and dark inside, save for the stream of diffused light that angles in through the siding and a poorly patched window. Sand dances in the air, but it's not enough to worry about, though I feel the sudden urge to clear my throat. Clayton peers out at the storm through one of the cracks, his light hair mussed from his sand scarf. I went to your mother's grave, he says, his voice muffled by a gust of wind. That's where your father said you would be. My body is sore from last night, though I try not to think about any of that as I sit down on the pallet of blankets, my back against the wall. I was at the water. I blow a strand of hair from my face. I know I must be a mess, and despite my exhaustion, I pull the remaining pins holding my hair in place, matted from my wrap and loose from the wind. You go to the water frequently then? I shrug and run my fingers through my hair, wrestling with the knots. 
I'm not sure how to answer him or what information he will take back to his father. I'm not sure it even matters anymore. Everyone knows about the spring now, even if they're not sure how to find it. It's what's hidden at the mine that gives me pause. I've been there a few times, yes. Clayton pushes away from his post by the wall and comes closer, leaning against the wall across from me. Don't look at me like that. I found out about it like everyone else the night of the party. A night of many surprises, it would seem. I mutter the last part and stretch my legs out in front of me, idly brushing the remnants of sand from my trousers before I allow myself to relax and take a deep breath. For both of us, he clarifies. I watch as he leans his head back and stares up at the rafters. Clayton seems different somehow, or perhaps wary from his adventures last night. While I came home to lie to my sister's face, Clayton likely went back to the brass rail to drink his anger away. What, you still don't believe me, he says. My eyebrows lift in amusement. I believe your words to me after the announcement were, don't be a fool. Strange words for a man who didn't know he was to be married. I didn't want you to make a scene. The room was filled with people. I panicked. Make a scene? Regardless of the fact that none of you seem to care, this is my life we're talking about. Whatever you think, Miss Mason, I am not a liar. I'm not like my father. Perhaps, I'm quick to say, unnerved that he can sit here and seem so blameless when my life is quite literally in his hands. And yet, despite how different the two of you are, or my opinion on the matter, we're still to marry. He regards me curiously, as if he's contemplating something but as the tension in the air quickly escalates, so does his scowl. And all of this only affects you, right? I eye his dirty clothes from last night. The drinking and the late nights, what's changed for you exactly? Clayton pushes himself away from the wall and walks to the other side of the train car. I feel like I'm losing my mind. The words are barely audible over the storm, but they faintly reach my ears. He runs his fingers through his dirty hair and shakes his head before he can gather himself enough to face me. Do you honestly think I wanted this? He nearly shouts over the wind. I liked my miserable life before all of this, the oblivion and the ease of it all. I didn't wish for this, Miss Mason. In fact, quite the contrary. He gestures between us, the repugnance written on his face cutting me more deeply than it should. How can you possibly think I'm unaffected? Because I'm trying to make this work? He braces his hands on his hips. My father is right about us. We would be a good match in many ways. Clayton sounds as if he truly believes it, and my heart breaks a little as another strand of hope tears apart inside me. Look, Clayton steps over to me and I tense as he sits on a wooden crate a few feet away. Elbows on his knees, he looks at me with a severity I've never seen in his eyes before. I know none of this is what you wanted, but have you stopped to think for a single moment what good could come of it? Of being tethered to your father? I laugh and stand up, needing distance from the intensity of his gaze. I'm too tempted to tear the shirt from my back to remind him of the last time his father decided I was his plaything. Clayton drops his head with a sigh. No tethered to me, he says, so quietly I barely hear him. He stares at the ground, and I wish for the first time that I could look at Clayton and see only him and not his father. But how is that possible when they live and breathe the same air, wander the same halls in the same house, when they both want to rule a town built on lies and secrets? I'll always wonder what he'll do next, I think aloud. If I say the wrong thing, use the wrong tone. Unexpected tears burn my eyes, and the effects of a sleepless night settle heavily over me. Miss Mason, he says, stepping closer. I know you hate him, and I don't blame you. He pauses, but I don't turn around. I'm sorry for what he did to you. God, you have no idea how sorry. But I'm not him. This is about you and me. You say that so easily, but I know nothing about you. Then give me a chance, he says more earnestly than I expect. The sincerity in his voice surprises me. Why are you so adamant? I ask and turn to face him. You know nothing about me. I know enough. 
The words roll off his tongue too easily to be rehearsed, and a warmth blossoms through my chest. Though I'd like nothing more than to look away from his gleaming, asking eyes to hide my discomfort, I don't. My family needs me. The words are weak, but true. I'm not asking you to leave your family, Miss Mason. You aren't cutting ties. You're doing something more. You and I can change this place. We can make it better. I can't, I breathe as a chilling wave of panic washes over me. Every time I imagine myself with him, I feel as though I'm betraying everything I am, all that I've wanted. I don't want to be your wife, and I don't want to be in the spotlight. I don't want anything to do with your father. This doesn't have to be about him, Clayton growls. It has everything to do with him. How can you not see that? Clayton looks away from me and shoves his hands into his pockets. Of course you've never even considered that I might actually be able to keep you safe. And how will you do that, exactly? You act so noble, as if you're trying to protect me and my family. But am I honestly to believe that you'll even be around? That you wouldn't be absent, tending to your other pursuits? Clayton's brow furrows. If you have such a low opinion of me, I would think you'd be happy that I would leave you alone that I would occupy myself with other pursuits. My heart sinks when he doesn't deny it, but I lift my chin. I thought you could see sense, Miss Mason, that you would want to do what's best for your family, just like I want what's best for mine. He takes a couple of strides one way and then the other. That's what I don't understand. How is having me as your wife good for your family? I would not be a genteel, pretty thing like your mother if I were by your side, Clayton, no matter what you wish of me. I would tell them the truth and uncover every horrible thing your father has done so they would know what sort of family they've let rule them for 200 years. You're so worried about my father, but have you stopped to think about the danger you're putting your own family in? I'm not completely dense, Josephine. My eyes widen at his familiarity, but he seems unfazed. You're the one plotting. You're the one who is going to do something foolish and get yourself and maybe even your father and sister in trouble. My frustration fizzles as his words sink in, and my lip feels tight and swollen as I pull it gently between my teeth. The bruises on my father's face are nearly healed, but how long before the marshal's men leave behind another reminder of how impactful my decisions are, one that might be more permanent? I have failed in every way to do anything remotely helpful and I have only myself to blame for that. You're right, I admit. Who knows what will happen to them? It's a thought that sickens me. I've been so adamant to find a way out of this, to rid us all of the marshal. I've lost sight of what happens if I don't. He steps closer. After what happened last night, I'd prefer not to speak of that. I turn away from him. What were you doing out there, Miss Mason? His voice is more urgent. If I hadn't been there. You were. Let's not relive it. I peer back at him. What's done is done, and I can't stand to think of it more than I already have. But if I wasn't, he repeats, as if I haven't played out the possible outcomes over and over a hundred times already. But Clayton mistakes my repulsion for cruelty, and his expression hardens. I forgot. I'm repugnant to you and don't get to care about your virtue or his hands all over you. Please stop, I cringe, reliving the roughness of Doyle's hands over my skin, the stink of his breath and the feel of his bristled face against my neck and cheek. I don't wish to speak of it. I can't stand the thought of him touching you. Clayton takes another step toward me, closing the distance between us with dark, ferocious eyes. I can't. He comes so close so quickly I squeeze my eyes shut and shrink away but Clayton's touch never comes. I hear only the wind against the storm of my heartbeat. When I open my eyes, sand floats in the air and the train car is still. Clayton takes a step back. His irises, the color of tropical pools from a long lost land, are wide and injured and confused. He swallows. You think I would strike you? He asks, deflated. I force myself to draw a few quick breaths and I shake my head. No, I say, surprising myself as I realize it's true. I just, I don't know why I did that. Feeling ridiculous, 
I straighten and avert my gaze. Clayton plops down on the wooden crate again, bracing his elbows on his knees. I don't want to fight with you, he says, but it seems we never find common ground. The tension surrounding us disperses, and I welcome the draft breaking through the seams in the siding and let it run through me. Why did you come? I ask him, to scold me again for last night, as if I don't feel foolish enough already. Brow still furrowed, Clayton stares at me, his eyes no longer giving anything away. I sit down on the blankets again, crossing my legs as I wait for him to answer. With a dispassionate smile, he says, no, actually, believe it or not, I wanted to apologize for last night, for what happened to you and your mother. It is inexcusable. His eyes are fixed on me, emotion filling them, and it's as if I can almost see the past 11 years replaying through his mind, at least what he knows of it. Thank you, I say, though the words sound stupid. Sometimes I think I could kill my father, knowing what he's done, even if I'm too frightened to learn the particulars. He stands up and nods to the space beside me. Do you mind? I shake my head. Clayton lowers himself down, not so close we're touching, but close enough I can almost feel the heat of him against my arm. He scrubs his face and runs his fingers through his hair, a quirk I've come to expect when he's uneasy. Cigar smoke and whiskey lingers faintly on his clothes, and I notice his throat move up and down as he swallows. My mother and your father. I stop, uncertain why I'm telling him this. Part of me wants him to know the truth. The other part of me simply wants to tell someone what I know. They were together. Clayton looks at me, his expression unreadable. I found out yesterday, he admits. My father told me. That surprises me, and I forget what I was about to say next. I'm sorry, he continues, almost mechanically now, though I don't want his apology. It's not your fault, I tell him. I simply thought you should know. It's one of many reasons I was in town last night. His eyebrows lift infinitesimally, and it makes me strangely happy to see some of the frustration lessen in his expression. I shouldn't have gone to town, I know, but I wanted more answers about my parents and your father. I thought I might actually be able to rally some of the townspeople behind me so I could expose some horrible secret. I laugh at myself. It was foolish. When the silence lingers too long, I groan and rest my head back on the siding. I'm so tired of secrets and lies. Can't we discover something promising, something that gives us hope instead? Like a cure, he says, staring up at the poorly patched window. A cure? For the choke. Yes, it's gotten bad. I think of the tickle in the back of my throat sometimes, and know it's nothing compared to the sand that lingers in the lungs of some. Scarlet is worried that Mrs. Pelly has it, among other things. Clayton clears his throat. Ten percent of the people in this town have it, he says, and my eyes widen. Don't look too surprised, he adds wryly. I only know because my sister has it. Who, Kitty? He shakes his head. Cute, innocent little Isabel is sick? I'm sorry, I say roughly. I had no idea. Clayton shrugs, but I can tell how much it bothers him. He won't even look at me. You know as well as anyone, Miss Mason, even the innocent are not safe here. When his gaze finally veers to mine, Clayton looks browbeaten and exhausted. Is Dr. Henderson doing anything for her? He scratches the side of his face where a light stubble has started to grow in. He has given her some tinctures, but she's getting worse. She has a few attacks a week now, even if she's not doing anything strenuous. Perhaps she's allergic to something in them, I offer. She's too young to be having such severe attacks, I should think. Clayton smiles at me, and my face heats. What? Why are you smiling? Because, he starts, his smile widening. You never cease to amaze me. His eyes are beautiful when they aren't shadowed, and I blush as I realize I've been staring. I close my eyes and clear my throat, but I can still feel his gaze on me, thoughtful. Unnerving. When I open my eyes again, his face is softer, almost apologetic, and his gaze shifts from my injured lip over my face. Slowly, Clayton reaches for me and brushes his thumb, warm and soft, 
gently over my bottom lip. I don't move. I don't want to, though my body trembles. Where his confidence makes him strong and certain as he looks at me, my inexperience makes me feel weak, and I have to force myself not to shut my eyes beneath his intense gaze. I would never hurt you, Joe, he says before his hand drops back down to his lap, and once again I'm stunned by the soft familiarity of my name on his tongue. I wish for you to be happy. Does that mean, I swallow, my mouth suddenly dry, that you will release me from our engagement? The question sounds both hopeful and a bit reluctant at the same time. Clayton doesn't answer, and the silence between us is too expectant to bear. I take that as a, are you finished trying to start a revolution? I blink at him, struck by his question and the answer I know is contingent on my answer, but I refuse to lie like everyone else. I will never stop looking for the truth, I admit. I want to know what's in the Deadlands and why your father is killing innocent people and pretending they're thieves. His jaw clenches, and I wonder if he knows something. How is any of that helpful? Because I think your father is lying about many things to keep people here in fear, and I think he has his men kill the people in the Deadlands, steal their things, and bring the goods back to us. And because I want to know what sort of a monster he really is. Clayton eyes me a moment, contemplating. So what are you going to do? Go to the Deadlands and find out what's going on for yourself? Are you going to stop him? I don't know, I admit. I will likely do nothing for fear of my family's well-being, but I still have to know. But I won't be able to let it go until I've learned the truth. Clayton shakes his head and an unamused smile pulls at his lips. I'd hoped he'd be more disgusted with what I've discovered. More curious, at least. Nothing will come of it. I tell him, I know this. Now, are you going to answer me? Will you release me from our engagement or not? No, he says quickly, and what little affection I thought I might have for him cracks and shatters to pieces along with my freedom. And if I refuse to marry you, I say, biting back tears, then I can't protect you, he says huskily and leans his head back against the sideboards, shutting his eyes. Silently, I scream. Chapter 23 Clayton It's quiet outside. The wind has finally died down, and a swollen silence hangs over us in its place. I watch Jo, asleep on the blanket with her back next to me. Although she never made a peep, I'm certain she cried herself to sleep, and I wish for the first time that I were the heartless bastard she thinks I am. It would make all of this more bearable. I take the opportunity to step outside for some air, needing another moment before she wakes up and I have to see the misery in her eyes again. As noiselessly as possible, I pull on the heavy door, opening it just enough to squeeze through. Hints of red peek through the cloudy sky like a thick fog on an early morning. The scent of sage floats with the breeze, and the muffled sound of coyotes yipping in the distance means the storm has fully passed. A storm I would have been decimated by, had it not been for Joe. A lot of good my heroic efforts were. For a split second I reconsider my decision to bind her to the engagement, despite what I told her earlier. But then, I think of Doyle and my father, and I know that the safest place for her is with me, even if she hates me for it. I know I should wake Joe and get her home so her family knows she's safe, but she seems to find peace when she sleeps, and I can't bring myself to rob her of that too. As much as I want her to understand why I'm doing this, I fear she will hate me forever instead. Even now, when it feels like this is the right thing to do, I wonder if it's for my own gain. The more she pushes against me, the more I see, and the more I can't let her go. The train car creaks behind me, and I hear her feet in the gravel. I brace myself to find hatred in her eyes as her footsteps draw closer 
light and measured. It's finally passed, she asks, her voice rusty from disuse. It's not a real question, but I nod. Joe clears her throat, her shoulder nearly brushing mine as she stops beside me. I stare out at the yuccas that begin to appear through the floating desert dust. We should get you home. Your father and sister are probably miserable in waiting. And yours aren't? There is no acidity in her tone, as I would have expected after the way we'd left things. Only simple curiosity and a little surprise. I can't help but wonder what picture-perfect light she has my life painted in. My mother, perhaps. I finally force myself to look at her. I'm sure Joe's never looked so mesmerizing. A curled mess of dark hair cascades down her shoulders. Her lip is still swollen, but pink, and her golden green eyes are heavy with sleep. I wait for the censure in her eyes to return in the silence, but it doesn't come. She simply stares out into the veiled afternoon, errant hairs catching the breeze as she crosses her arms over her chest. She refuses to look at me. I can tell by the way she taps her fingers against her arms. You were saying about your mother? She prompts. Yes, well, while my mother is likely worried, Kitty thinks she would never be so lucky to be rid of me. A blotch on her family name. Joe gasps. Surely Kitty wouldn't wish you dead. Given Joe's closeness with her sister, I can see the sincerity in her eyes, and it warms my heart a little to know that at least she doesn't want me dead. I regard her a moment longer, then peer out at the wild landscape. You don't know Kitty, then. She's despised me from the moment I came into the picture, knowing I've taken the spotlight. But when I'm dead, she'll resent me for dying so inconveniently and leaving her alone with our parents, so I can't win, can I? Although I laugh, it's not the slightest bit funny. Kitty might hate me for the circumstances of my birth, but there are truths I now have to bear so that she doesn't have to. My mind wanders to the hysterical gleam in my father's eyes as I had him pinned against the wall, then to my mother's expression as I stormed from the house, ready to tear my father to pieces. No, Kitty and Isabel don't know what I will do about their father, and I will never tell them either. Poor Kitty, Joe sighs. I watch her from the corner of my eye. I can imagine she feels powerless perhaps forgotten about. She will never have her father's esteem the way you do, nor your mother's attentiveness. I've seen the way they look at each other in church. I can imagine Kitty's a bit lonely. Aren't we all? I say under my breath. Though Joe is right. Kitty's life is lonely, even if she has every material thing possible. She has a stepmother she doesn't want, a father who can barely stand her, and a brother who treats her with the same contempt as everyone else. She has Isabel, at least. Joe stares down at her hands, rough and tanned compared to mine. Yesterday, I start, recalling the horror on her face, the way you looked at those bodies we saw in town. She drops her hands by her side, and her hazel eyes shift to mine. Did you know them? She brushes the dust from the sleeve of her blouse. I've seen them before, she admits, two days ago, very much alive at the stream. I can almost see her uncertainty to confide in me teeter back and forth. They looked much different. What do you mean? Their clothes were made of fur and leather, and they gave me no trouble. They were wearing furs? She nods. Their horses were draped in them. They came down from the mountains, I think, after the people in their village were slaughtered. You spoke to them? I exhale my anger as it bubbles to the surface. Damn it, Joe! Her gaze fixes on me and hardens. At first I think it's because of my informality, which seems to slip more and more around her. 
but she shakes her head. What? They had food and clothes and water? They had weapons, but didn't try to hurt me. They didn't try to steal anything from us. I know they didn't. They had no reason to. I step away from her, trying not to overreact, as all the possible scenarios of horrible things that could have happened circle my mind. Let me guess, I start, taking a deep breath. You were alone and unarmed, and you let your curiosity get the better of you. It's not a question, and I can imagine it easily enough. With a groan, I rub my temple. Not that it matters now, but no, I wasn't unarmed, she says flatly and takes a step closer. Do you understand what I'm telling you, Clayton? They were innocent people, and your father had them killed. My first instinct is to tell her she's wrong, that he's my father and, despite his brash conduct, he's not a murderer. But I would be lying to myself. We both know better than that. How would my father even know about them unless they tried to steal something? She shrugs, unconvinced. Even if they did try to steal something, that doesn't make them dangerous. When did murder become the only reasonable punishment for everything? Your father has his deputies out there around the perimeter all the time to keep drifters out. He tells us as much himself. She turns and begins to walk away. I can tell she's frustrated with me, but I'm uncertain why. I believe you, Joe. I'm not saying I don't. I follow after her. But are you honestly trying to convince me that every drifter has been innocent after all these years? Perhaps the deputies didn't want to take any chances. Perhaps, she answers hotly. But changing their clothes? That's right, I forgot you're a detective. No, a revolutionary trying to save us all. Joe rounds on me. It's better than doing nothing. Her tone fills with indignation and her anger shifts from my father to me. You preach all this nonsense about making this place better, but you waste your time questioning me, trying to find the answer you want instead of accepting what you know is the truth. Look, I say, rubbing my temple. I didn't say that I would do nothing, nor is that my intention. But I'm worried about you right now, not the town. Well, don't be she says. I nod in defeat, too exhausted to argue with her, and turn toward the train car. We should get you home. Clayton, she heaves a sigh. Wait. I stop, though I don't turn to face her, for fear of what other admission might escape my lips. Will you look at me, please? She asks softly, and she rests her hand on my arm. I stare down at her fingers. They are warm and strong, despite their size. And, reluctantly, I meet her gaze. If you help me, I won't do anything stupid, I promise. I just want answers, nothing more. Her tone is soft, but her eyes are imploring, and I'd be an idiot to push her away when she's finally putting her trust in me and asking for help. Fine, I agree, hesitant. Joe does need protection, but I'm beginning to wonder if it's not from herself. Chapter 24, Joe. I was so worried. Scarlet removes her foot from her stirrup, steps back down onto the dirt, and lets go of her horse's reins so she can smack me chidingly on the arm. Just as hastily, she pulls me against her, squeezing tightly. Papa said you were likely hiding at the train station, but you were gone so long. I look at Mr. Ashford, then meet my father's relieved gaze over her shoulder. Dressed and ready with their horses, the three of them look as if they had been preparing to ride out in search of me and Clayton. Yes, well, we fell asleep while we were waiting for the storm to pass, I tell her, leaving out the details of our stop at the stream to water our horses. I'm not certain I'm allowed to tell her and definitely not with Mr. Ashford and Clayton standing there. I'll unsaddle the horses, Mr. Ashford says, tying his up outside the stable. He takes Chessie and Duke, and my sister follows with Ruby, her mare. So, I ask, looking to Clayton, what happens now? It's a loaded question, with a dozen implications and inquiries behind it, but Clayton nods to my father. 
As a thank you for your daughter saving my life, I think a dinner is in order. Clayton addresses my father directly, but sneaks a quick glance at me. I hope that the three of you will join us for supper. Does Wednesday work? My mother would wring my neck if I give her fewer than two days to prepare everything. My father looks at me, waiting for some sort of reaction. All I can see is the fading bruises on his face, and I nod. Thank you, I say, without looking at Clayton. That would be nice. Scarlet hurries out of the stable. Did I hear something about a dinner? Yes, Clayton says. It will have to happen sometime, so we might as well get the first awkward dinner out of the way. Scarlet laughs. How wonderful, and thank you for bringing Joe back to us safe. On the contrary, Miss Mason, Joe is the one who brought me back in one piece. Clayton exudes charm as he smiles between my father and sister, then he looks at me. Until Wednesday, he says, five o'clock. Clayton mounts Jules, glances at me one more time, and with a whistle, they gallop off, disappearing down the drive. Get yourself cleaned up my father says. Jane is preparing cheese and meats for your return. I'm sure you're hungry. Concern shadows his features as he peers out at the settling dust left in Clayton's wake. I wonder what thoughts taunt my father now, and if he's really going to go to dinner with us on Wednesday. He always seems much more at ease around the marshal than I am, or at least he acts like he is. He's had to face him at their monthly meetings over the years, with only Mr. Ashford as their buffer but I know my father hates him, and a dinner with all the Cunninghams seems too much to bear. As if he can't bring himself to look at me again, my father excuses himself to the stable to assist Mr. Ashford with the horses. Jell? Scarlet asks with a smile in her voice. She regards me with a full-on grin engulfing her face. He called you Joe. Are you two so familiar now? Amusement rings in her voice and I roll my eyes. We're getting married, what do you expect? Besides, it's nothing like that. And you, always so polite to him. I dare say even excited. Whose side are you on, anyway? It's like he's won you over already. Scarlet laughs. Well, I do like him, surprisingly. He's much more pleasing than expected, you must admit. I admit that you're a traitor, I growl half-heartedly, and we head toward the house. Though my stomach rumbles, I pull her to a stop. I'll meet you inside, Scarlet. I need to do something. I'll only be a minute, I say, knowing that the conversation I need to have with my father will be anything but easy or quick. I kiss her cheek, hand her my dirty sand cloak and wrap, and walk back down to the stables. I stare out at the sky, still cast in a crimson haze, and I try not to think too hard about what I will say to my father, only knowing that I must. When I reach the stables, my father is leading Chessie to his stall, and Mr. Ashford is brushing Duke, hair matted with dried sweat. You rode him hard, Mr. Ashford says, a small hint of a smile parting his lips. I'm not sure what I would do without him, I reply, and Mr. Ashford and I exchange a silent agreement that things are better between us, perhaps that he's forgiven me for the way I've treated him. Joe, my father asks, walking back to us, you should be eating. We'll take care of the horses. You need to rest. After that fall off your horse last night, and now this. My lie about last night stings more than my disfigured face. I will, I promise. His eyebrows draw together as he considers me a moment, and his eyes begin to shimmer. While my father is often a solid mask of indifference, I can see the worry in the lines around his face, and in the way his mouth purses as he examines my busted lip. Don't worry about me, really. I'm fine. I just need to speak with you a moment. It's important, I add, so he knows I won't let it go. His brow furrows and he nods to Mr. Ashford. Let's head up to the house then, he says and follows me out of the stables. If you're going to argue with me about the dinner. I'm not, I assure him. Of course, I would rather not go, but I know it's what must be done. He looks at me strangely, more out of curiosity than surprise, I think, but I wave him away. It's not about that. I try to think of what to say. I'm angry with my mother and hurt that my father never told me, even though I understand why he didn't. I know about Mama and the Marshal, I blurt out, unable to look at him. I know what she did, and I know why he killed her. 
He stops beside me, and I can't bring myself to look at him and see the anger or the pain in his eyes, whichever is waiting for me. But the silence draws out too long, and I can't stand not knowing. I glance at him. He's watching me, and his eyes are more yellow than blue in the dying light. He pulls his mustache between his teeth and peers down at his feet. And how do you know this? It doesn't matter how I know, I say, stepping toward him. I just do. I can understand why you wouldn't tell me, but I don't want you to carry the weight of that alone. I want you to stop keeping secrets from me. I want to be your partner in this. You're not my partner. You're my daughter, he grinds out and stares up at the sky. You're my baby girl, and I'm supposed to protect you from all things. I know I haven't been able to do that, but this, I wanted to protect you from this. My eyes widen. Well, I'm glad to know. At least I have some idea why this happened to us. At least I know the truth. I swallow thickly. Did you know about them? While it was happening, I mean? He peers around the farm, his brow pinching as he tries to hold back tears. Finally, he nods. I want to ask him if he's angry with her, like me, if he misses her even though she was unfaithful and reckless with our family. But the hurt in his eyes prevents me from saying another word, and I wrap my arms around him, tears falling from my eyes. I'm so sorry, Papa. I grip him harder. He almost feels frail in my arms, but I know he's not. His arms tighten around me, and he cries silently into my hair. He lost the love of his life before she was even gone, if he ever really had her at all. How many times had his heart broken since? For the first time, I see my father how he really is, broken and tired. And like me, I think he feels alone. Chapter 25 Clayton I walk through the front door as the sun begins to descend behind the mountains. The house is quiet, save for the sound of Ainsley, the butler, hurrying into the foyer. His generally guarded blue eyes widen. Ah, Mr. Cunningham, good afternoon, sir. Evening, Ainsley, I say, too distracted for conversation. I don't know if I'm irritated by Joe or if I admire her. I'm exasperated either way and can't seem to get her out of my head. The more I think about the dinner invitation, the more I worry it's too soon. The Masons? Here? With the Cunninghams? I beg your pardon, sir, Ainsley says as he steps up to the banister, and I pause halfway up the stairs. Your mother has been asking for you since the storm let up. He glances to the large closed door behind him. She's in the library. Whatever her opinion of me since last night's shouting match with my father, my mother can always be relied upon to worry. I retrace my steps and head through the foyer to my mother's sanctuary in the library. My sisters and father, I ask Ainsley over my shoulder. The marshal has been out since this morning, and your sisters are dressing for dinner, I believe. Thank you. With a nod, I open the library door and find my mother sitting on the sofa with her embroidery cloth in hand. Her graying hair is pulled up messily atop her head, as if she'd been sleeping on it. Her gaze lifts to me, and her eyes crinkle as she flashes me a relieved smile. There you are, my darling. She sets her stitching aside and throws the blanket from her lap. I was going mad with worry. She rushes over to me, taking my hands in hers. I'm fine, mother, I say, offering her a squeeze of reassurance. I'm sure I didn't know what to think. Your father said you came home, but you didn't stay. And after what happened between the two of you. I step past her and over to the whiskey in the cabinet. Yes, well, I was in a bit of a rage, for good reason. I thought you might have drunk yourself to death, she adds seriously, but a chuckle escapes me. No, mother, I was not drinking. She steps up behind me and wrings her hands together. Please, Clay, tell me what's happened. Your father wouldn't utter a word. I'm not exaggerating. I've been worried sick. I'm sorry you've been so worried, I say, taking a long pull from my glass. But do I not have the right to be angry after everything I've learned? A curl 
sprung from her bun, bounces as she takes a step back and lowers herself to the settee. Tell me, she pats the cushion beside her. Please? I peer around the room, ensuring we're alone, though I'm not entirely sure why. I can't sit. I've been sitting too long. I pace instead. Running my hands through my hair, I glance at her. Please, tell me you didn't know that father killed Mrs. Mason. My mother's face whitens, giving me pause, but her expression remains unchanged. Tell me you didn't know he's a murderer and a child abuser. I try to keep my tone in check, but the words drip from my mouth like saliva from a rabid dog. Please be ignorant. I can't bear to resent her, too. A what? I watch her, gauging the sincerity of her surprise. You knew none of this? She swallows thickly. I know what happened to Caroline, she says regretfully, though I've never spoken to Marcus about it. What would I say? What would I do? She looks away from me, and I try to control the sickness that grips my insides, the secrets, the lies. She steeples her fingers and presses her palms together. It was while you were sick. I was consumed with worry for you. Ainsley ran to find me, uncertain what to do, and I saw her body on the sofa in Marcus's study. She measures my expression before continuing. There were lovers, Clayton. I knew that from the beginning, before I married him. He loved her fiercely, and he still does, I imagine. So he killed her, and you say nothing? I can't help my contempt. I am barely holding myself together after learning this, yet you've known this whole time. I shake my head, angry with her, disappointed. I can't believe you did nothing. Her features pinch, but she straightens her shoulders and lifts her chin to meet my gaze. I thought my son was going to die, and Marcus was sleeping with another woman under my roof. I had little thought for her in that moment. And her family? What of them? Or the fact that she's the one who saved my life? Shame colors my mother's cheeks, but I hold her gaze. I can't believe how easy it is for you to speak of this. Easy, she says. This time her voice sounds almost amused. Nothing about the past twenty years has been easy, Clayton. Especially not when I've spent my entire life trying to keep you safe, to provide for you. It's why I married Marcus, after all. And Joe, I fume, what of her? Did you know he beat her within an inch of her life? I punch through the glass cabinet. Clayton! The moment the glass shatters, the sting of blood dampens my hand, but I clench the pain away. The library door flings open and Ainsley rushes in. Is everything all right, Mrs. Cunningham? Just an accident, Ainsley, thank you, my mother says. Please, give us a moment. We'll call for you once we've finished. He bows and steps out of the room, hesitantly shutting the door behind him. My mother stomps over to me and takes my hand in hers, the fury of Lilith herself burning brilliant in her eyes. Stop this, she demands. First, you attack Marcus, and now this? This isn't like you, Clayton. You are not like him. Stop being a brute and tell me plainly. What are you talking about? She wraps her handkerchief around my bloodied hand, and squeezes. Her eyes are softer, pleading. I can't help you if I don't understand. There's nothing you can do to erase the past eleven years, I say, glaring at the blood. All I can picture is the heap my father must have left Joe in. Her fear, her pleas and screams, and the pain. My heart hurts, and my eyes sting. Her back is a stained glass of scars, I tell her, wishing I could unsee the image and undo the past. My mother's lips purse to a flat line as she steadies herself. It's shock I see in her eyes, horror that makes her nostrils flare. She doesn't ask any questions because she knows he's capable of it, and that sickens me more than I expect. 
Joe and I had an altercation last night. I needed to go to her this morning, I say, sparing her the details. The storm hit, so I stayed. An altercation? Her eyes widen. Is she all right? Shaking my head, I let out a ragged breath and allow my mother to lead me to the edge of the sofa. Ornery, stubborn, angry with me, but she's well enough. I went with the intention of letting her out of our engagement, I admit. But I couldn't do it. My mother's gaze rests heavy on the side of my face, and after a few moments, I force myself to look at her. Her eyes host a cloud of emotions that make me feel loved, even as I feel an astounding sense of uncertainty. You care for her, she says, and it troubles me that she's right. My feelings don't matter. She's miserable. I let out an annoyed breath and rest my head in my unscathed hand. I'm not sure I blame her. That's only because she doesn't know you. She knows plenty. She knows I'm a gambler and a drunk and that I'm my father's son. My mother laughs, mirthless as it is. Sometimes, yes, but that's not all that you are. Well, that's all she sees and cares about. My mother pulls my other hand into her lap, clasping them both as she leans closer. How would she know anything different? I'm a gentleman, I say defensively. I've always been a gentleman to her. I try to be kind. As does every other ingrate in this place when your father's around. What's that mean to her? Power? Control? Darling, she needs to know the real you. I'm trying, I say, but I sound like a sullen child. I would love nothing more than to throw a tantrum and make my life someone else's problem. But I know that's not true. I shake my head. I wanted to release her, to show her I am not like him. But I didn't. I can't just let her go. All of this has sent her into a spiral. She won't rest until she's done something foolish. And you can protect her from herself? I shake my head and laugh. At first I thought I could, but I shrug. Now I just hope. You hope she will grow to care for you and give you a chance? She will never love me, mother. I know that much. But I also know that letting her scamper around in the desert by herself, sneaking through town late at night, getting herself into trouble with no one to protect her, will get her killed, or worse. I think about Doyle's hands on her again, remembering his intentions to ruin her and I have to clench my mouth shut so as not to curse. My mother's hand, cool and soft, strokes the side of my face, and I exhale the pain in my jaw. Whether it's my name and position, or my future role as marshal, I feel I can do more for her than anyone else. With a soft sigh, she smiles. You are a good man, a man I am very proud of. I try to ignore how desperately I want Joe to see beyond my father and trust me. You're my mother. You have to say sentimental things like that. Her cheeks round with a small smile and her lips part. True. She drops her hand back into her lap, clasping mine again. When you were a boy, you were determined to prove to Marcus that you were worth saving. Her recollection conjures up old memories of better times. Happy times with a man I admired, a father when I had none, who adorned me with his love and affection. His stories and promises for my future all seemed so big and important. But after my illness, everything changed. All this time, I thought he was disappointed with me for being sick. I actually thought he was a mess because of my illness and thought he would lose me, I realize but he was pining over the loss of a lover. I wonder how my mother can even stomach it. Look at me, she says softly, turning my face to meet her gaze, like she used to when I was a boy. Your father loves you.
That I am certain. And you can't dwell on the past. You must focus on your future, because he will be gone one day, and you will be left with the burden of this place, like it or not. I just hope for your sake you choose to live the life you want differently than he did. If you want to be with Josephine, you must fight for her. My mother clears her throat and heaves out a sigh. The day your grandfather, tyrant that he was, took Caroline away from your father, Marcus was changed, and look what's come of it. He pretends he's in control, so collected in front of the people, but behind closed doors, his decisions are eating him alive. Surely even you have noticed. It doesn't have to be that way for you. She leans closer. Don't be a fool when it comes to your heart. It's what can make or break a man. And what of you, mother? Father did as he pleased, and now you're in a marriage to a man who never even loved you. She flinches. I'm sorry, I don't mean... He has loved me in his own way, and he has held to his end of the bargain, protection in exchange for an heir, a proper family. We have been safe and well cared for since we came here. He's never treated me poorly. But you miss Damien, my real father. Of course I think of him. There's a stretch of silence, the steady rise and fall of my chest, my mother's quiet breaths. Then she continues. Had Damien's death not been so untimely, I think you two would have been very close. She studies my face, sentiment filling her eyes. You're so much like him sometimes, it almost hurts. But Marcus has been a good father to you in many ways, even if it's hard to see that now. There's a racket in the hallway, and she blinks away her faraway thoughts. Things could have ended worse for us, a widow with a newborn. I think about what happened to that woman in town last week, Ms. Reinhurst. She has no children to care for her, no husband to protect her. Miss Mason did a wonderful thing helping her. I know there are good people in this town, but there are many who aren't as well. Do you think Father has made them that way, oblivious and selfish? She shrugs. He inherited an impossible mess, just as you will, she says sadly. She stares out the window at the oranges and reds that stripe the sky. Mother, Joe thinks those drifters yesterday were innocent, which means he didn't just stop at Mrs. Mason. She eyes me carefully, concern furrowing her brow. Joe is a clever one, isn't she? Too clever, I grumble. I've been worried something like this might happen. Marcus has been distancing himself for months now. I fear something is wrong. There's a cough outside the library door before it creaks open. Izzy peeks around the corner, her eyes alighting when she sees me. Clay's home! She runs toward me and into my arms, and I try to ignore the sound of her wheezing breaths as I breathe her in. Careful, my mother warns her softly. He's hurt. Oh, I'm fine, I say, dropping my bloodied hand away from her pretty dress. For the first time when I look at her, I see my father's eyes and some of his goodness. I see all of my mother, and even some of Kitty. Izzy's little arms wrap around my neck, and she kisses my cheek. I knew you couldn't be dead. Isabel, my mother chides her with a laugh. Izzy frowns in confusion. But that's what Kitty said. I laugh when my mother rolls her eyes. I told you not to listen to a word she says, silly. I kiss her silky cheek and smell the sweet scent of vanilla. You smell like cookies, I say, eyeing her hungrily. You smell delicious, actually, and I'm very hungry. A little pink smile begins to form, and I set her back on her feet. I take a pointed step toward her, fingers waggling, and she shoots from the room with a screech. Come and get me, she calls from the foyer. Clayton, you'll get her all riled up, and she'll have a coughing fit. I kiss my mother's cheek, wishing there was something reassuring I could tell her. She's a child, mother. She has to have a little bit of fun. I won't get her too worked up. 
I turn for the door and my mother squeezes my arm. What will you do, she asks, about Miss Mason? I run my fingers through my hair and reluctantly meet her gaze. Well, for starters, I've invited the Masons to dine with us on Wednesday. Her brow lifts in surprise. I see. Then you have a plan, I take it? Not a fully developed one, but I don't worry my mother with the uncertainties. You said I should let her get to know me more. So, it's a good place to start. Chapter 26 Joe Isabel has occupied all my thoughts since dinner. Whether it's the hollowness of Clayton's voice when he spoke of her sickness that stuck with me, or imagining she were a little scarlet, struggling to breathe, I want to know more about the choke. While the poorer folks tend to have suffered from it more frequently, given their less-than-ideal living circumstances, Isabel is afforded every luxury and safety, yet she suffers too. The investigator in me is too curious for sleep tonight, so I sit in bed, poring over what medical books I have by candlelight and scanning my great-great-grandmother West's journal with new eyes and purpose. Black lung, the choke, toxic fogs, sand, feather-like tickle, wheezing and coughing fits, tightness of the chest, shortness of breath. I tap my finger against my cheek. Infection of the lung, allergic reaction, overexertion, their symptoms are essentially the same. There was no cure for black lung, and Dr. West made many failed attempts to lessen the pain and symptoms. Both infiltrate and linger, they're triggered similarly. There's a quiet tap on my door. Joe, Scarlet whispers from the other side. Come in. Creaking the door open, she peeks inside, her red hair falling over her shoulder in a long, thick braid. I saw your candle was still lit. Her eyes scan the books sprawled out on my bed, and she tilts her head in feigned exasperation when she sees my hands covered in dry ink. It's late, she says. You're up. I counter and set my quill back into the ink pot and close all the books, pushing them down to the end of my bed. I gesture for her to join me. On light feet, she patters in and climbs into bed, like she used to when we were children. What are you doing? she asks. And if I'm not mistaken, she looks a little worried. Nothing that will get me into trouble, if that's what you're asking. She blinks at me. Isabel has the choke, and I couldn't sleep, so I figured I would read into a few things. Scarlet's eyebrow lifts. Many people have the choke, she tells me, as if I don't already know that. She smirks. Your interest in her welfare seems a bit sudden. I shake my head. If you're insinuating that I'm doing any of this for Clayton, you're wrong. It's for my own curiosity, though I do feel bad for little Isabel. It's okay to do it for Clayton, Joe. She takes my chin between her fingers and examines my healing lip. What did he say about this? She asks crossly. Did you tell him the same lies you told us? Because I know as well as you do that your shirt doesn't rip from falling off a horse. Not like that. She drops her hand into her lap. Next time, if you're going to lie, you might as well come up with something more believable. Though her voice is light, concern makes her eyes sparkle. It doesn't matter what happened, I tell her and lean back against my pillow. The thought of seeing Doyle's face here after what happened nearly makes me sick. Scarlet squeezes my shoulder. It wasn't him, was it? She asks, her eyes shifting over me in a sudden panic. Clayton? No, but he was there. It was Clayton who helped me. Helped you? Scarlet leans back, her mouth pursed in anger. Tell me what happened, Joe. I didn't tell you about any of it because it was foolish, and I was angry at Clayton. He was shouting at me and drunk, and I was embarrassed. Scarlet waits for me to continue, if a little impatient. Before I tell you what really happened, you must promise me you won't tell father. He'll only worry, and he has enough to worry about. Scarlet's fists clench in her lap, and she pulls her bottom lip between her teeth before she finally agrees. I recite what happened with Doyle in town, leaving out most of the gritty details. Scarlet smacks my shoulder. What on earth were you thinking? Clayton's given me enough grief, I tell her. Good, it means he actually does care. Perhaps this marriage is just what you need. 
If nothing else, he can help keep you safe from yourself. You sound just like him, I grumble. I am grateful to Clayton. No matter what I said to him, I know he saved me. Not just my virtue, but from one more scar I'd have to bear, even if it cost me a bit more of my pride. I rest my head against Scarlet's shoulder, close my eyes, and exhale the tension of the last 24 hours. I asked him to let me out of our betrothal, but he will not. No? The thing is, I think he planned to end things, but decided against it. I remember the strain in his voice and the way he avoided my question. So you believe he has the power to make the decision on his own and go against his father's wishes completely? I stare at the fading wallpaper, searching for the answer to the question that's trailed behind me these few days past. I'm uncertain what he believes his options might be, but I know that if it were me, and I was the sole heir to a legacy of power, I would use it to my advantage. What's the worst his father could do to him? He needs him, after all. What the marshal might do to me, though, is a completely different question, and I try not to think about it. Or, Scarlet says curiously, he knows exactly what power he has, but wants to marry you. Her expression softens again, and she looks almost relieved. Maybe Clayton wants to marry you because he cares about you. I don't see how, I mutter, feeling restless under her gaze. I'm not his type of woman in any sense of the word. Perhaps that's why he's fond of you, Scarlet offers. A whore is not a partner or a wife. She's a pastime. Perhaps Clayton is lonelier than you realize. My cheeks redden when I wonder what he would have done had I let him touch me in the train car instead of cowering away. Or perhaps, I realize, he feels beholden to me for what his father did. The remorse that riddled his words was evident. That may be, but the way he rode out of here today, risking his life to try to find you in time, I don't believe for an instant that it's simply a marriage of convenience for him. He's a decent man, and I truly do think he cares for you. I never said he wasn't a decent man. Scarlet eyes me carefully. Then why are you still so set against this marriage? Because you're so quick to accept it, I say without thinking. I sigh and straighten in bed, uncertain what my thoughts are now after all that's happened. Who says you cannot grow to love him? You see something in him too, I know you do. I can tell by the way you look away from me every time I speak his name. Scarlet's eyes are fixed on me, victorious and determined. You fear falling in love with him more than anything. Admit it. That would be hazard enough, I admit, but it's nothing to being within arm's reach of his father. Your reluctance is not just about the marshal, Joe. You know it's not, at least not really. Mostly. Scarlet shakes her head, unwilling to believe it. You said it yourself. Clayton is a decent man. He's not likely to let his father hurt you. I think you know that. Her mouth pulls up in the corner and her green eyes sparkle with mischief. Oh, really? What else am I thinking? I ask sourly. It would be good to know in case anyone else asks me. Scarlet crosses her arms over her chest and her full lips press together as she contemplates. Finally, she ventures an answer. You are scared because you're a novice where he is proficient. Scarlet leans closer, assessing me, seeking truths even I'm not comfortable with and I want to shrink under her scrutiny. Clayton is experienced, and you are as pure as sponge sugar. I beg your pardon, but that's not what any of this is about. You think I care? Yes, I do think you care. In fact, I think you worry that if you care for him at all, he might be taken away from you, like Mama. Or perhaps you worry that he will not love you back, or that he'll be warming someone else's bed at night while you have an affection for him. Her hands flutter, and she takes a breath. I can think of a dozen reasons you would fear him, Joe, and all of them are to protect your heart. I measure her words. Joe, you're my dearest sister. I'm your only sister, Scarlet. And therefore, you are my dearest friend. She straightens. You always say you know me better than I know myself, but the same goes for you. I know this is new for you. You've never had to let someone in before but I feel in my heart that Clayton is a good match for you. But you have to take a chance. If you have a real conversation about it with him, and you simply ask him why you should entrust him with your heart, 
perhaps his answer would surprise you. Though I do see in Clayton what Scarlet does, the memory of Marshall Cunningham's breath against my face and the searing pain on my back sits so close to the surface I can barely see Clayton beyond it sometimes. I look at my sister. Even if you and Clayton are so sure he can keep me safe from the Marshal, what of the deputies? What about Doyle and his band of merry men? He assaults father, he assaults me, and after what happened between him and Clayton last night, he will not take lightly to any orders Clayton may give him. Then Clayton gets new men. Scarlet, my younger, braver sister, kisses my forehead. With the Marshal and Clayton at your side, no one will touch you, Joe. Perhaps you just need to learn to wield that power. Though her voice is light and easy enough, I know it's only for my benefit. Her eyes are sad, thinking of the future. Us, I add, no one will touch us. She nods, but I can't accept that it would be so easy. She makes everything sound so simple. But when I think back two weeks, a month, a year, when I weigh the fear and misery of the last 11 years against a potentially optimistic future with Clayton Cunningham, it feels so wrong and impossible. They told me about the water, Scarlet says, shocking me. They did? She nods and clears her throat. And Joe, there's something else you should know. Last night, while you were sneaking about, Mr. Ashford asked Papa for my hand. My mouth falls open. My heartbeat flutters and I feel my cheeks redden along with Scarlet's. And you said nothing about this until now? You came through the door with a busted lip and tattered clothes. I'm sorry, but I wasn't thinking of it. Her voice pitches as she combs her hair away from her face with her fingers. I know you don't approve, but I see in him what you don't, and I care for Mr. Ashford, deeply. Scarlet, I say with a sigh wondering how I could have turned my sister into this timid creature who won't even look at me when speaking his name with affection. I turn in my sheets to face her and take her hands in mine, waiting for her to meet my gaze. I am happy for you, just as I am happy for him. I squeeze her hands, allowing myself to smile with true happiness for the first time in so long it's invigorating. Scarlet studies me a moment before she finally accepts my sincerity and a grin brightens her beautiful face. I was wrong about him. I know that now. I tell her and wrap my arms around her shoulders, desperate to comfort her as her body shakes against mine with happy tears. I worried about telling you. Never worry about telling me anything, I plead, ever. I pull her tighter against me. I'm so happy for you, Scarlet. She chokes out a happy, relieved sob, and I kiss her cheek. When I finally let her up for breath, her eyes are shimmering like the moss in the hidden, glassy stream. You deserve happiness. So does Mr. Ashford. Scarlet's smile wanes and her brow creases with confusion. That's a strange thing for you to say, Joe. She eyes me carefully as I contemplate which parts of Mr. Ashford's past I should share with her. What do you know? She chews her lip as she waits for an answer. No more secrets, Joe. Taking her hands again in mine, knowing his story will be as difficult for her to hear as it will be for me to say, I proceed to tell my sister about the night the marshal abducted me, what Mr. Ashford lost as a result of helping me, and about Toby. By the time I'm finished, tears of sadness dampen her lashes and trickle down her face, and even though I'm the one who put them there, relinquishing one more secret feels right. So you see, I can't be angry at Mr. Ashford anymore. I never should have been in the first place. He helped me when no one else would. And because of me, he has suffered greatly. Scarlet shakes her head. You've been carrying all of this around with you? She rasps. You've never said anything. I've only just found out about Toby and Mrs. Ashford. Still, she says, inhaling a deep, ragged breath. You have seen Jonathan every single day since. You've relived that night with the marshal over and over, and I've been blind the whole time. Scarlet, it's all right, I coo and wipe the tears from her cheeks. I'm just happy for you, I smile. You and your Mr. Ashford.
Okay, so that wraps up part two of Dust and Shadow. I hope that you're enjoying Joe and Clayton's adventure. Again, I know it's got a westerny vibe to it, but what can I say? I'm a country girl. So be sure to like and subscribe. Part three is coming out soon if it's not already, and all the links will be in the description below. And I would just want to say that if you even slightly enjoyed this book, please make sure you listen to Earth and Ember because that one is probably the most beautiful story that I've written to date. All right, see you at part three.